Hola, buenos días. Don Rafael Domínguez. Good morning, Rafael Gomez, Vice President of the Can Provincial Council of Pontevedra, Rodríguez Vice Director of the School of Restoration of Cultural Property of Galicia. Welcome to this uh, meeting, to this Congress. Uh, we've been reflecting in Pontevedra for 12 years now on how to develop one of the most important tasks of museums within their society to, get, to ensure that the legacy that we get from the past is something that we can um, transmit, convey to the common generations to the best possible conditions in this uh, edition. We would like to focus on something that is very um, present in uh, debate and discussions, not only in connection with the role of the museum in the society, but also in terms of the relationship of human beings with the environment, uh, natural environment and with the concept of sustainability within a context uh, of tension between human beings and the resources and the planet. It is our responsibility to focus on the steps that we museums need to take uh, with a view to reducing its impact. So we have thought that it was very appropriate what the uh, Department of Conservation and Preservation of the Museum of Pontevedra to suggest this uh, topic for this edition of this Congress for us as an institution and also For the professionals who are here today, for the experts who are here today, it is of fundamental importance to get to know initiatives that are in this line and that help us to um, create ideas and to raise awareness on the fact that the pathway of sustainability is irreversible and inescapable. In this regard, we all museums have a lot to do and uh, room for improvement. So based on this uh, humility, it is important to say that we at the Museum of Pantavera have taken important steps towards a sustainable management by implementing a quality management system that has helped us to achieve the S certificate of sustainability for uh, the Spanish authorities. Um, behind this certificate, uh, we have the uh, commitment to sustainability in management in uh, fields such as uh, uh, communication of new uh, initiatives, uh, organization of temporary exhibitions, or the conservation and re uh, restoration of the property and assets that we are in charge of. I would like to thank the uh, organizers, Mercedes Briones, Mercedes del Campos, Cartaboda, and Mercedes Vaquero, for implementing or for organizing this uh, encounter, this Congress, and also the Higher School for the Preservation and Conservation of um, um, Cultural Property of Galicia for their support. We would like to thank all of them. I would like to highlight the contribution of Maria Auxiliadora Llamas Marquez, the president of uh, ICOM Spain, ICOM Spain, the International Council of Museums, is going to, uh, well, uh, has supported us and, uh, and has, made, has made an effort to be here with us today. Thank you very much. Um, good morning to all of you. I am here on behalf of Carmen Lorenzo, the head of the Galician School of Conservation and Restoration of Cultural Property, who is on a medical leave, and we hope that she will recover as soon as possible. I would like to welcome all of you, participants, uh, speakers, especially to those of you who are coming from very far away places. Mangetak, thank you. I hope that you have a uh, very good uh, days of science and uh, exchange of knowledge. The work of the scientific community in terms of selecting the people who are going to be taking the floor has been exceptional. So I would like to thank the staff of the museum, the Provincial Council of Pontevedra, uh, uh, all of them who for the last 12 years have been uh, working together uh, within the framework of a strong commitment uh, for the organization of these uh, congresses, which are a great opportunity for both students and uh, professors. And we really thank them for that. So you know about the topic that we're going to be focusing on. Uh, we're going to have an introductory morning on 
mm, uh, the state of matters that we have a institutional part and then the afternoon we're going to be talking about museographic uh, topics tomorrow we're going to be dealing with a number of the specific cases and for me it is extraordinary to look at the way that we've been able to gather very important institutions within the framework of uh, um, or within the field or from the field of uh, conservation and restoration from all over the world sustainability deserves this uh, it is not just a matter of uh, fashion or a fashionable thing or just empty words. We want to um, deal with uh, sustainability and uh, cultural heritage uh, uh, hand in hand. And this Congress uh, is going to be fruitful in that regard. And that's it, basically. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning to all of you. This is the 12th uh, Conservation and Restoration Congress that we organize here at the Pontevedra Museum together with the Higher School of Conservation and uh, Restoration of Cultural Property of Galicia. Thank you to Álvaro uh, Vizriaga, the head of this school. And, uh, as the person in charge of this museum, I can say that we are facing extraordinary challenges. Uh, firstly, to take this museum to Santa Clara and the uh, central museums. Also, we need to touch value to them and to reopen them after 10 years of closure. But this has a goal. And this is to make the Museum of Pantabeda not only a place for exhibitions, but also a place for knowledge and uh, culture. A place where we can, through um, events such as this, we can implement and continue doing a great work as we have done in the last few years. I would like to invite you to uh, visit Pontevedra. I would like to uh, invite you to uh, visit the Museum of Pontevedra, the restaurants and the bars of Pontevedra, which have a uh, high quality too. But above all, I would like to invite you to take part in this Congress and to take part in this exchange of knowledge and culture. The goal behind this Congress is to revitalize the museum, but also culture in this uh, city with events such as, um, uh, well, uh, the 25th edition of, uh, I mean, the organization of the Biennial in, in 2025, after 10 years uh, where, when this has not been organized. So I declare this Congress open. I thank you all, and I hope that you will have a very fruitful meeting. Buenos días. Gracias al Museo de Pontevedra por, por esta invitación. Eh, siempre que vengo and today, whenever I come to Punta Raja, I feel at home uh, because people here are very welcoming. Welcome from them. This is an extraordinary institution who has been a centre for culture for many years now, not only in terms of its collections, but also in terms of these activities that they organise. Uh, on behalf of the ICOM, well, I have to say that we've been working uh, on sustainability and the value of museums for some years now as sources of power and uh, credible centers that can generate change, bring about change for the citizenry. Uh, this is what we're going to be talking about with Maureen Rees now. So Maureen has studied architecture at the University of Wales and he studied uh, history of art at the University of Oslo. He's been an architect in the United Kingdom and Norway and since 1994 he's worked in museums. He's worked in uh, Norwegian museums such as the Falstad Center, which is a memory of historical memory and a human rights center that's located in a Second World War concentration camp at the Henny Ostad Art Museum outside Oslo, just outside Oslo, the National Cultural Center of Stikkelstad, which is near to the uh, pilgrimage site, pilgrim site 
that gets to the Cathedral of Need that was in Trondheim and is dedicated to the memory of Saint Olaf and also the Varangia Museum uh, that in the Arctic coast of no no Norway. He is cooperating with the Varanger Museum in a project of research on museums, forests and sustainability. Also, he uh, is a part of ICOM and has been the president of the Working Group for Sustainability that was created in 2018. And he is now the president uh, of the, uh, the temporary president of the new uh, International Committee of uh, Sustainability, of uh, Sustainable Development of ICOM that's going to uh, start operating in the beginning of 2024. I think that the important thing here today is for him to tell us about his experience and for him to give us an introduction uh, to the issue of um, sustainability and the important role that museums can have in terms of raising awareness among the citizenry. So I hand over the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, those kind words uh, and good morning. Um, and thank you to the organizers and to ICOM Spain for uh, this invitation to join you all today. Wow, could you switch that one off? Maybe? That was right in my eyes. Wow. <laughs> okay. Um, this is working. For over 30 years, Rita Mesquite, the former director of the Museum of the Amazon, has been researching and protecting almost inconceivably large tropical forests. Tens of millions of acres of protected areas. However, she realized the purpose of these protected areas was unknown to ordinary people. I got to thinking about the need to communicate with society more directly about biodiversity in the Valley of the Amazon. The chance came with an invitation to run a new museum to be nestled in the 25,000 acre forest outside Manuas. She knew she couldn't get all the city dwellers out into the wild jungle, so she decided to bring the jungle to the people. Museums worldwide have long engaged with questions of sustainability, biodiversity and ethical responsibilities. As the Museum of the Amazon shows, one of the central challenges for museums at this precipitous moment in history is how to communicate the threats to natural habitats, the lives and livelihoods they support. There's a considerable body of research that suggests that activating the public, giving them agency through participation, is a precondition for resolving the challenges the global community faces. Without an active electorate, politicians are unwilling to undertake the difficult choices to achieve sustainable futures. The wider context of this presentation then is the museum's role in communicating and activating our public to participate in all matters pertaining to achieving a sustainable future. Within the, within the wider context, within the, the presentation has two aims. First and foremost, it will account for the work on sustainability within ICOM, the ICOM organization in the period 2016 to 2023, focusing on the new museum definition. Both in the process which led up to its endorsement in 2022 and in apparent tensions between traditional and new understandings of the museum it embodies, the definition has important productive implications for the potential impact of sustainable approaches in the museum sector. Secondly, we can consider some examples of how the global museum institution may be in the process of developing a many-centered, non-hierarchical community with which to address sustainability viewing museums as containing the essence of vast forests of knowledge, a term coined by Ulysses Aldrovandi, a distinguished Renaissance naturalist. It will advocate conceiving museums as nodes in a global knowledge network, facilitating responses to the challenges facing museums and their communities. The term sustainability was introduced into public discourse in the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment in Stockholm in 1972 and was reaffirmed in the Brenton Report in 1987. It defines sustainable development as meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Already here, we need to stop and reflect. 
Arne Ness, professor, philosopher, and father of the deep ecology movement, proposed that the Brentland definition should be amended to read. There is sustainable development if, and only if, it meets the vital needs of the present day human population without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own vital needs. Ness wrote, we who live in the global north often accept needs that if met, exclude sustainable development in every acceptable sense. And maintain that if we had, have an ethical obligation to our fellows and that anything that serves the vital needs of the future generations must take priority. As far as to the satisfaction of these vital needs, he wrote in 1990, at present, a substantial number of human beings live in a desperate state of poverty and oppression, which clearly prevents a minimum satisfaction of these vital needs. He also notes that this doesn't mean that we have no serious obligations towards non-human beings or classes and systems to such beings, or indeed of the earth as a whole. 30 years later, as we view the state of the planet, the situation has not improved. Neither ethics or sustainability are foreign concepts to museum professionals. At a time when ICOM is revising its own code of ethics, it is also programmatically committed by the 2022 definition to researching, collecting, conserving, and interpreting to society the world's natural and cultural heritage, present and future, tangible and intangible. Okay. Yes, that must just show how much uh, unfair and just the world is at the moment. <clears throat> the, no the notion of custodianship for future generations in the management of heritage has long formed part of the museum's ethical self-conception. Although it's true to say that the universalist conception of the museum, with its basis in contested thought systems, has increasingly been challenged as has the notion that the environmental crises <laughs> playing havoc with the planet are solvable by the economic system that engendered them. Furthermore, it's not without significance that the history of ICOM, <clears throat> founded in 1946, also straddles the period of the immense changes the planet has experienced in the 75 years of ICOM's existence, changes that have led to these crises. Described as the Great Acceleration and leading us today onto the cusp of the Anthropocene, this period encompassed the massive expansion in carbon emissions, threats to biodiversity, and other human impact, impacts on the Earth's system. Okay. In what can be seen as the global society's response to the Great Acceleration, the United Nations member states signed two treaties in 2015, the UN Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement. The former aims to transform our world through the means of 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, the latter to reverse the emissions of climate gases. Unfortunately, neither of these treaties have had any significant effect on the crises they were created to address. But what of ICOM? How has it responded to the unsustainable nature of the Great Acceleration? ICOM itself began to address sustainability within the organization in the middle of the last decade, building on the concept of custodianship for future generations. Although given the regional diversity of its membership and the different views of what approaching sustainability might signify in these regions, different conceptions in addressing sustainability were, and indeed are, unavoidable but I'm not, I might add, irreconcilable. ICOM responded to the two above-mentioned treaties by establishing a working group on sustainability. Its mission, its mission to help ICOM consider how the, to mainstream Agenda 2030 in the Paris Agreement, and in the words of ICOM's president, museums were to be understood as relevant institutions promoting communities' knowledge about the climate crisis and sustainable behavior. The working group's first mandate period culminated in the resolution on sustainability and implementation of Agenda 2030 at the General Conference in Kyoto. 
The resolution committed ICOM to aligning all its practices with the SDGs and highlights how museums as trusted, knowledge, trusted sources of knowledge are invaluable resources for engaging communities and are ideally positioned to empower, empower the global society to collectively imagine, design, and create a sustainable future. The resolution's adoption and implementation not only marked a recognition of the scale of the challenges to ICOM and its members, but also the urgency of addressing them. This was confirmed in a speech by ICOM's president, Alberto Garandini, to the G20 Ministers of Culture in 2021, stating that the resolution led to the, end, the 2030 agenda becoming the fundamental reference for ICOM's work over the next decade and beyond. The resolution addressing sustainability can be seen as marking ICOM's entrance onto the global stage of sustainability and climate discussions, as evidenced by its presence at the last two COPs, an invitation to address the G20 Culture Ministers Summit and participation in a number of European Union initiatives. However, and perhaps more interestingly, ICOM as a member-driven global organization can also be viewed as a receptive framework for the development of local sustainable initiatives, bottom-up approaches along the lines suggested by Eleanor Ostrom, Nobel Prize-winning economist and theorist of the commons, who wrote after the failure of the Copenhagen COP in 20, 2008, do not despair if politics moves slowly at the international and national levels because a diversity of actors and institutions is already self-organizing in ways that will help to compensate for the collective inaction problems at higher levels. Evidence of such a diversity of actors and institutions can be found in the many initiatives addressing sustainability undertaken in recent years by individual members and member institutions, the ICOM family, also in the many significant networking initiatives undertaken by ICOM's national and international committees. One can also point to the success of International Museum Day in 21, 22, and 23, each tied to three of the SDGs. Here it is possible to discern the contours of a de developing many-centered, non-hierarchical community addressing sustainability. During its second mandate period, the working group was given the task of developing a framework sustainability action plan for the period 2022 to 2030 for ICOM. This second mandate period was also distinguished by three other major international processes in ICOM, define, creating a new museum definition, the strategic plan, and the revision of the Code of Ethics. In each of these important processes, the ICOM members confirmed that addressing sustainability was a priority. The Framework Sustainability Action Plan weaves together the recommendations of the Working Group's first mandate period, adjusted with feedback from and consultations with the whole organization. The aim to create a roadmap for activating the membership. It's based on ICOM and stood as a member-driven bottom-up organization, invites all ICOM committees to consider the sustainability of their own strategies, priorities, and work plans, and provides a set of criteria for members to identify these. And moreover, by sharing progress and using the committee's own mechanisms, conferences such as this, publications, etc., to drive short-term action while scaling up ambition in the long term. ICOM is now in the process of creating SUSTAIN, an international committee replacing the working group, in order to locate ICOM's approach to sustainability firmly within its own permanent organizational structure. The goal to offer ICOM's members a new arena and an accessible platform where they can influence the future direction of the organization in all matters pertaining to sustainability and climate breakdown. Since the middle of the last decade then, on one level, there's been a growing awareness throughout ICOM of the necessity of museums addressing the existential challenges that the world and all its inhabitants are facing. It now has a framework action plan in place, together with a resolution of intent, it also has a strategic plan and the soon to be revised code of ethics, both these emphasizing sustainable approaches that enable an organization to face the future with much more confidence. The creation of the IC will also assist in the consolidation of this work undertaken throughout the organization over the six, last six years. On the other hand, there are significant limits to what ICOM can and cannot do. 
some due to its size and diversity of its membership or to the statutes and regulations, other to the fact that individual museums are not, in a strict sense, bound by any of its resolutions, and some to ICOM's location on the global international governance level, mirroring perhaps that glaring gap we all can see between lofty aims and inaction in the wider world. One thing ICOM can do, however, and indeed has been doing since its foundation, is defining what a museum is. So let's now turn to this crucial part of ICOM's engagement with sustainability. Since the end of the last century, a growing impetus to rethink what a museum is and should be has gained momentum, both within and beyond ICOM. Different tendencies converge in this reassessment, some of which have already been mentioned, the increasing diversity and differing functions of museums in different regions of the world, and in particular the colonial legacy, managing collections and challenges around de-accessioning, the increase, increasing recognition of museums' societal role and the communal aspect of museums, and after COVID, the digital museum. Also, a questioning of its purport, purported neutrality and apolitical character, and finally achieving sustainability and averting the threat of climate change. All these have engendered the process which culminated in the endorsement of this definition. I'll leave you to read it. It was uh, adopted by a majority of the General Conference in Prague. The museum definition, it is frequently said, forms a backbone of ICOM. It's the most widely disseminated and quoted definition of a museum. The Prague definition, while building on previous ICOM definitions, introduced a number of new concepts. Museums foster diversity and sustainability. They operate and communicate ethically and with the participation of their communities. These elements held a shift in the perception of what museums might concern themselves with, which will be packed in, unpacked a little bit later. Clearly, the new definition constitutes a milestone in ICOM's work on sustainability. Moreover, both the process of creating it and its contents shed light on the challenges facing the museum, the parameters of which limits its engagement with the topic and the possibilities in, that inhere in the member-driven nature of the organization. The definition itself exhibits a Janus-like quality. On the one hand, looking back to the characteristics held to be the, of those of the traditional museum, collecting, documenting, researching, and exhibiting cultural heritage. And on the other, through the inclusion of these new terms, acknowledging the rapidly changing environment museums operate within the terrain of a sustainable crisis and climate breakdown. With regard to sustainability, it's interesting to note that it is connected to what museums should do. In the words of Henry McGee, founder of Curating Tomorrow, the new definition clarifies the purpose of museums, that it is, is that they foster sustainability. In other words, they contribute or should contribute to sustainable development by satisfying human needs and aspirations, protecting and restoring nature, and building social justice. The definition operates with a both a descriptive is and a normative should. This definition, with its inherent tension, described as a compromised solution between traditionalists and reformers, is indicative of a deeper global division between forms and conceptions of museums, and came at the end of a lengthy process which began in 2016, and in which the vote on an earlier, more radical definition proposed and put forward in Kyoto in 2019 was postponed at what has been called one of the most controversial assemblies in the history of the organization. But before looking at that tension and how it's evident both in this process and the final definition, a brief account of what or how museums have been thought about and defined earlier. The term itself, as you all probably know, stems from the Greek seat of the muses, a place of creativity and learning in the medieval period. The term was revived in the sense of a literary collection or set of records as a synonym of knowledge institution that plays the role of a library or as a synonym of the collection of knowledge. It was in this latter sense, Ulysses Aldo Vandini, the aforementioned distinguished Renaissance naturalist who actually established the world's first botanical gardens at Bologna in the 16th century, envisaged his vast forest of knowledge, where everyone can find what poets, theologians, legislators, philosophers, and historians may have ever written, as well as any object that might come from nature or creativity. And 
As a brief aside, if any of you have ever doubted about the importance of the traditional approaches to collecting, a collection of pressed flowers taken from the hillsides of Bologna 500 years ago is a knocking knowledge about how the climate crisis and human migration is changing landscapes in northern Italy. Picked between 1551 and 1586 by Aldovandi, the 5,000 delicately cut and dried plants form one of the richest collections in, of its time. Nearly half a millennium later, his carefully pressed specimens are helping botanists document the enormous changes that have been taking place in the surrounding landscapes. <coughs> this according to research done by the British Royal Society and published earlier this month. Here are two more from Aldo and his collection. Returning to the museum as we know it today, it's indelibly a product of the modern era. From its origins in the 17th century Wunderkammer via its emergence in the muse museum age at the beginning of the last century as an international knowledge institution, its current position is one where museums are increasingly viewed as institutions engaged in and supporting the societies they operate within. The first attempt at defining a modern museum around the end of the 19th century focused on criteria for circumscribing a museum's activities and was prim primarily scientific. Likewise, the first definition developed by ICOM in 1946 neither described the museum's functions or its aims. It was not until 1961 that we began to see recognisable elements of fuller definition emerging where a museum is a permanent institution which preserves and displays for purposes of study, education, enjoyment, collections of objects of culture or scientific significance. A more radical proposal of what a museum should be was introduced in the Round Table of Santiago, organized by ICOM and UNESCO in 1972. It presented the museum's role as being at the service of society and its development. Two years later in Copenhagen, a definition that is recognizable also today was adopted this was further tweaked in 2007 to include tangible and intangible heritage. When the proposal of the new definition was presented in 2019 at Kyoto, it took the assembled representatives by surprise. The proposal marked a clear break with previous definitions, although arguably addressing many of the concerns that are increasingly manifesting themselves today. A lengthy debate ensued. 70% of the representatives voted to postpone the vote until the next general conference. A new working group, DEFINE, was established to develop the new definition. Importantly, DEFINE invested the process with a new methodology. Extensive consultations were conducted throughout the organization with particular focus on ensuring that voices previously overheard received representation. Overheard, that's wrong. Not listened to, received representation. In retrospect, the definition debate in 2019 can also be considered as a watershed for ICOM and the method methodology of DEFINE understood not only as a positive response to the critical voices raised in Kyoto, but a confirmation of the fundamental member-driven bottom-up nature of ICOM. Indeed, the revision of the Code of Ethics has also followed this methodology. The process of creating the definition of this emphasis on individual opinions of the members reveals that the future of ICOM and the museum sector may lie less in grand global programs, but rather building on its character as a member-driven organization comprised of a network of knowledge institutions. The new definition in, uh, adopted in Prague acknowledges the tension between heritage on the one hand and engagement with social and environmental crises of our time on the other. It's more outcome, outcomes focused than previously stating museums should foster sustainability, communicating ethically and with the participation of their communities reflecting the way that museums make a difference is not only with their own four, within their own four walls, but by supporting the development of a better, fairer, more environmentally conscious society beyond their institutions. So what are, so what are the new terms in the definition? Foster sustainability, operate and communicate ethically, and participation in the communities involved for museums and museum practitioners. What are the museums? specific characteristics, practices, and traditions that can assist in achieving these goals, and how can ICOM's med members, both institutional and individual, contribute to fostering sustainability? That this is a matter of urgency is without question, already a half the allotted period for Agenda 2030 has passed. Unfortunately, the UN's own Global Sustainable Development Report for 2023 finds that at this critical juncture, midway to 2030, the incremental and fragmented change that is taking place is insufficient to achieve the sustainable development goals. 
while the UN's General Secretary has issued a stark warning on the consequences of inaction on the Paris Agreement, with extreme weather events accelerating, he suggested that humanity has opened the gates to hell. So first, one must acknowledge the organisational measures described earlier in the presentation taken by ICOM, the resolution, definition, strategic plan, code of ethics, and framework action plan, that together have created a framework within which museum initiatives can flourish. Secondly, to recognise that there are tens of thousands of physical museum spaces in ICOM member countries, each supporting the tradition of museums as repositories of knowledge in the service of their communities. And with regard to the latter, we're also at the point on the institution's historical trajectory where museum practitioners are very much aware of the importance of dialogue with our visitors and the communities that we are part of. This awareness is of critical importance as we look to engage our public, activating our communities, giving them agency through participation. These are preconditions for resolving the challenges that the global community faces. And here are a couple of examples of agency. The first, a museum in Northern Norway giving assistance to a fishing community's rebellion for a return to sustainable pathway to the future. Vare Restored is a project facilitating new stories and business activities in heritage sites in Varda. Varda was once a major Norwegian fishing harbour. It's on the northeast coast of northern Norway on the border with Russia. At the end of the 20th century, the fishing industry collapsed, the population halved, yet cooperation between the local community and Varda Museum, initiated from outside the museum, has resulted in new optimism. Restored consisted of an interdisciplinary team that developed a people-first philosophy focusing on the people who owned and wished to run their businesses in heritage sites in need of restoration. The museum provided the infrastructure for the project, among other things, initiating a program for craftsmen to develop forgotten traditional skills. It has helped over 50 owners in the rest restoration of historical buildings. The Coma Festival, the Coma Festival, a spin-off, was an attempt to wake Varda from the coma that the city's decline had caused and reverse depopulation. A celebration of Varda's physical heritage through the means of street art, over a dozen international street artists created 55 artworks in the course of three summer weeks. The project also nurtured the ground for the coastal rebellion originating in Varda, which is a widespread, non-violent, non-political initiative directed at the dramatic structural changes in Norwegian fishing policies. One of the aspects of restored success is how culture is woven into a political message. This is a hotel under restoration, built at the beginning of the 20th century by Russian fish entrepreneurs on the island of Orde. The rebellion mentioned earlier originating in Varda, drawing among other things on the energy and belief created by Varda Restored's radical approach to conservation and the Coma Festival's use of art as a political tool. The uprising's message was clear. Decline is always the corollary of political choice. Local communities are the key to sustainability in the blue economy. In the, vast, in the past, the repositories of knowledge have been found in the museum institution. Having been found in the museum institution have reflected the views and attitudes of the museum practitioners who worked in the sector. However, the new museum definition with the inclusion of terms of sustainability, diversity, ethics and communities offers the possibility of new approaches where the repositories of knowledge are nurtured by our public. Here it's worth noting that the use of fostering in the definition brings with it certain connotations that it would be well to be aware of as the following synonyms evidence in the ways of what foster means, encourage, promote, further, boost, advance, help develop and nurture. Vardo restores exemplifies a museum fostering sustainability through being fostered by its community. These 10,000s of museums that make up the museum institution can be understood as a network of cultural nodes unique in a global perspective. They offer in the same physical space a site where both local and global sustainable viewpoints can be communicated. Museums in the future could thus be both intimately connected to developing local community narratives on sustainability and climate breakdown, and as members of ICOM, an integral part of a worldwide organization disseminating global sustainable narratives, each informing the other, but most importantly, empowering communities to bring about the change necessary to a chain, attain a, an equitable, habitable, sustainable planet. 
Panda is a colony of aspens in Utah, USA, with one massive root system, 82 years older, covering 43 hectares. It's the world's largest single organism. Pando is an example of a rhizomatic plant system. A rhizome is a horizontal underground stem of plants. They strike new roots out of their nodes down into the soil. They also shoot new stems up to the surface out of their nodes. They have no clear beginnings, no end. They are eccentric and anti-hierarchical. Rhizomes of knowledge is a beguiling metaphor for the global museum family. Museums too are nodes in a network. They are linked together by common goals and practices, sustained by tradition, custodians of knowledge for the communities and for future generations. Each node a separate repository of knowledge, tangible and intangible. They enable us to know our past, to better understand the present, and to prepare ourselves to face the challenges of attaining a sustainable future. Pando is nurtured by the environment it's part of. Unfortunately, it is dying. The probable cause, climate breakdown. So how can this network of cultural nodes that makes up the global museum institution nurture the growth of these repositories, these rhythms of knowledge? Maybe by nurturing them in the fertile ground of local community activism, as in Varda, utilizing the bottom-up approach, replenishing these repositories with the significant stories of global re relevance from local communities, thereby also achieving a reciprocal nourishment of the cultural nodes themselves and inspiring the global network perhaps by providing a physical site for community activism. Of course, museums themselves are able to initiate projects that aim to disseminate the important messages that the United Nations are attempting to communicate and not succeeding. The Sylvanium Forest Museum in Austria invited students at the Vienna Academy of Fine Arts to illuminate the consequences of climate change. The exhibition shows works that explore the relationships between humans and nature and create ideas of a future version of life. In doing so, a dialogue is created between the museum's historical collection of objects and the students' contemporary forms of expression. The students process these diverse impressions in their artistic projects in many very different ways. Two examples. A spruce whose genus will largely disappear in Austria due to climate change is preserved in a river later and thus protected against global warming. However, the system remains dependent on electricity production via the umbilical cord of an electric cable. This need to rethink our position on nature was highlighted in all the students' work. As in this performance, it staged the burial of a tree with the funeral marches by the Reffling and Brass Band and a devotion in the local chapel. The student ex exhibition shows works that explore the relationship between humans and nature and create ideas of a future version of life. In doing so, a dialogue is created between the museum's historical collection of objects and the student's contemporary forms of expression. Museums then, as nodes in an existing worldwide network, I suggest, are ideally placed as spaces for promoting transformation. Through involvement in a local community initiative, a long-term environmental protection, social justice, and people's needs, museums can form a critical mass of knowledge that has the potential, where its global networks, to activate the global public, a prerequisite for the necessary political action. Finally, in closing, I would like to draw your attention briefly to a role of museum research in the transition to a sustainable future. The research project uh, floating that I'm involved in at present has its origins in the historical timber industry in Norway, where rivers were the only ways of moving timber from forest to their customers on the market, a much more sustainable method than today, of course. The project is a collaboration between four universities, five museums, the Norwegian Directorate of Cultural Heritage and representatives of ICOM and Norway's UNESCO office. That's a perfect example of museums being involved in SDG 17, which is uh, all about partnerships with the goals. Nature is at the center of the sustainability debate. The world's forests are crucial for global weather systems, for any strategy to mitigate the devastating impacts of climate change and for the survival of the vast majority of wor the world's known and unknown living species. Moreover, forests represent one of the clearest examples of a sustainable system, both metaphorically and in reality. 
The project has three goals, to carry out research on the Norwegian Forest Network core themes, developing perspectives and methods in research that build on the United Nations Sustainability Goals, and to discuss professional development, research relevance and research dissemination in order to make museums' social role more concrete. As part of the programme, it is also run a future scenario building workshop focusing on how museums can foster sustainably, investing, in, investigating questions such as the need for radical change is pressing to avert the crises facing the planet. And while the museum sector is evidenced by icons, example has the potential and willingness to play an active role in the transfer, transformation. The question remains which direction the sector is heading into in the future. What happens if we can't collect anymore? Or can't build new facilities? Is bigger better? Instead of expanding, can museums scale down? How would that accord with museums seeking a more active role in fostering sustainability for their local communities? Is there a pathway into the future that allows museums to operate as today? Can we continue with business as usual? Or does the sector need to transform completely? I'll leave you with these questions and answered. Hopefully some answers will be given when the research is published in 2024. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to listen to the second uh, keynote presentation. We have invited King Kratchung, who is a, a curator of a past present and future of materials, and she's specialized in sustainable practices in the field of art and has wide expertise as curator in different studios, museums, and she has also worked with private curators in Germany. She's the manager of Key Culture, which is an NGO that has a purpose of uh, working towards linking sustainability with the uh, heritage properties with, uh, from the point of view of the materials and also the sustainable practices of storage, packaging and exhibition. She's going to explain to us uh, about key culture, its achievements, the past, the present and the future. So I do hope you will find it interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Scratcher. And thank you for the, what I assume is a warm and don't have my headphones on. Um, I'm so delighted to be here today and very much appreciate the um, invitation and hospitality that I've been shown. Um, so we're going to discuss key culture, uh, as was mentioned, I am the materials director there. Uh, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about my focus on materials over the past mm, about four and a half years working at Key Culture. Um, so let's just uh, jump right into it. So why does it matter that the cultural heritage sector is sustainable? Well, because the cultural heritage sector has a fairly significant environmental impact the arts sector, this is also including commercial enterprises, emits more carbon dioxide per year than Austria, 77 million tons to be exact. One of the main contributors to CO2 emissions is the transport of artworks by air freight to collectors, museums, galleries, art fairs, and flying personnel around the world for installations and on-site meetings um, also contributes to these numbers. Another large factor is the energy expenditure to maintain climate controls in museums and gallery exhibition spaces. And in part from CO2 emissions, a large volume of single-use plastics are commonly used in art transport, storage, exhibition making, and especially during art fairs, only to be discarded immediately after use. So again, how big is our impact and does it matter? So some people say it doesn't matter if we changed our practices and cultural heritage because the footprint of cultural heritage is not as large as, let's say, the military, fossil fuel companies, fast fashion, and the healthcare industry. 
Um, often measuring the impact of our practices in museums is the most effective means to encourage behavioral change. Plus, you can't manage what you can't measure. Um, our partners at Art to Acres and Artists Commit uh, have started measuring the carbon footprint of exhibitions through their climate impact reports. Uh, a contemporary art exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art um, Los Angeles generated 214.5 tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. Um, but that number seems kind of vague, so what does, what does that look like? Well, 214.5 tons of carbon dioxide equivalents um, equates to all of this. So 46.2 gasoline-powered passenger vehicles driven for one year. Um, you know, the numbers are there. Um, so this is the carbon emissions from one singular exhibition at one museum. Uh, there are 95,000 museums in the world, each producing dozens of exhibitions annually. So imagine how quickly this all adds up. So from conservators to key culture. So Caitlin Southwick, um, our, our founder and CEO, is a stone conservator by trade. Um, she worked in her postgraduate years at the Vatican and on site in various locations around the world and was dismayed by the environmental burden of conservation pra uh, practices and treatments. Um, so we're all probably familiar with these in this room. Um, we can see her here wrapping a statue in plastic wrap that will be thrown away immediately after treatment. Uh, and she's seen here on the right pouring toxic chemicals on a sculpture outdoors. So she felt compelled to do something about it. So she initially founded um, um, uh, SIC, uh, Sustainability and Conservation, as a postgraduate student around five to six years ago. Uh, and this is how I also inevitably became involved with key culture. So my background, as was mentioned, I was the resident conservator at Studio Olafur Eliasson in Berlin for eight years. Um, so this is a massive studio uh, for the conception and production of Olafur's artworks. Um, the majority of the artworks are fabricated in the studio and also packed into crates um, in-house at the studio. And we had a packing problem. So this is a, an example of an artwork. Um, it's one of the driftwood artworks. And you can see here, it's just completely packed to the brim with polyurethane foam. It's wrapped in Tyvek. Um, there's just so much of this plastic um, synthetic foam that we used. And um, I had a problem with that. <laughs> so I hope we're all familiar. Uh, in this room with uh, the traditional packing materials we use in cultural heritage. So Tyvek, polyethylene foam, bubble wrap. So we use them because they're tried and tested. We know that they're inert, durable, and won't readily degrade in the crates and don't interfere adversely with these artworks, um, which makes them ideal for our transport and storage. But these same material properties are obviously not desirable at the end of their working life. As we all know by now, these synthetic materials are derived from non-renewable fossil fuels, um, are toxic to both the environment and people, and can take up to hundreds of years to biodegrade in landfills, depending on the type of, of plastic. Um, and as we know by now, recycling these synthetic materials is not, an al not always a straightforward solution. The majority of these materials, in fact, are not recycled. Um, so there are no numbers that I, that I could find that currently uh, convey the volume of packaging materials in use in the cultural heritage and art sectors, but I reached out to a prominent UK-based fine art shipping company and they shared their data with me. Um, we can ex attempt to extrapolate the magnitude of synthetic packaging materials in circulation worldwide for the transport of artworks to fairs, collectors, and exhibitions. Yeah, this is uh, staggering. This is only within a six-month period. Um, yeah, almost 3,000 3, kilos of polyethylene rolls is just remarkable. Um, <clears throat> so much like Caitlin, I felt determined to figure out a better way forward in transport, art production, and exhibition making. Um, at the time, and this was around 2018, 2019, I was researching into sustainable packing materials uh, online and couldn't find much information. 
Um, there's information on sustainability. There was information, obviously, uh, in the cultural heritage sector, but nothing that really intersected both of those. Uh, so I discovered SIC and was very active in their online forum, uh, asking tons of questions that no one had the answers to. So I got in touch with Caitlin, um, and she had told me about her plans to found a nonprofit, uh, and as a part of this nonprofit, to make step by step online sustainability guides uh, for cultural heritage professionals, and asked me if I'd like to become involved because I was such a nerd about it, <laughs> researching materials at the time, um, which I obviously did. <clears throat> so Key Culture was formed, and Key Culture primarily develops and facilitates various projects and programs for sustainability in the cultural heritage sector. Its focus is on collaboration, communication, and education. At Key Culture, we believe in making sus uh, sustainability accessible and easy. We work with various organizations around the globe and are involved in large-scale projects, including Europe's Go Green project. Um, so I, as I mentioned, um, we published three key books online in 2020, Energy, Social Sustainability, and Waste and Materials. Um, they're all free to download from the Key Culture website. So I was at the helm of the Waste and Materials key book, um, which is already three years old. And I feel like I've learned so much in the last three years. There's new research. Um, there's new approaches to materials. I don't even think that there's such a thing as sustainable materials. I think there's sustainable approaches to materials. Um, so I'm, I'm working on an update of the Waste and Materials key book. Uh, one of the first things we're doing is removing the term waste from the title because we want to reframe our relationship to the concept of waste. Um, waste signifies that materials are no longer useful to us, and we want to think of materials as being uh, infinitely useful and never, never being thrown away. Um, so in a circular economy, the concept of waste doesn't exist. Uh, so I'm gonna highlight some of the updates that we are working on for the materials keybook. Um, so in the previous version of the Waste and Materials Keybook, um, we included the waste hierarchy. Uh, so it was essentially supposed to uh, help in the day-to-day -day material choices that we make in cultural heritage and also in our consumer lives. Um, so as you can see here, uh, refusing is at the top followed by reduce, reuse, repurpose, and recycle is at the very bottom um, as the absolutely last resort for materials at the end of their useful life span. Um, and this is because, as I mentioned before, much of what we think is being recycled is not actually being recycled. Um, so for the new version, the updated version of the materials keybook, um, I would like to include the zero waste hierarchy and kind of push these hierarchies to their limits. So this is the new kid on the block that will replace the waste hierarchy in the new edition. Um, so the zero waste hierarchy is actually, it's not super new, it's from 2019. Um, and the zero waste hierarchy is more in line with principles from the circular economy, which we will get into in a minute. Um, so the definition of zero waste is the uh, conservation of all resources by means of responsible production, consumption, reuse, and recovery of all products, packaging, and materials without burning them, and with no discharge to land, water, or air that threaten the environment or human health. Um, before we talk about the circular economy, uh, we need to address the, our current mode of consumption, which is the linear economy. So products and materials in the linear, linear economy are manufactured to be thrown away. So these are single-use materials, um, these are disposable materials. And in the circular economy, nothing is waste. In a circular economy, we stop waste from being produced in the first place. Uh, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, um, they're the leading voice in the circular economy, defines the circular economy as based on the principles of designing out waste and pollution, keeping products and materials in use, and regenerating natural systems. So 
when we talk about the circular economy and designing out waste, there are two cycles at play, the biological and the technical. The biological cycle, oh, whoops, sorry. The biological cycle entails manufacturing materials and products from natural renewable resources that will biodegrade back into biological nutrient at the end of their useful lifespan, thereby replenishing the earth to continue the cycle. And this is primarily done through uh, composting. Um, the term biodegradable, I, I've, I've recently um, developed a problem with this term because I feel like it might be used often in a greenwashing context where we're told materials are biodegradable, but they're going to landfill where they degrade in anaerobic conditions and produce methane and um, are not replenishing the earth in any way, shape, or form. So composting is really the only um, means to produce like a vital fertilizer from these materials at the end of their lifespan. In the technical cycle, um, the technical cycle essentially entails keeping products in use um, for as long as possible, as well as manu manufacturing products that can be disassembled and their parts reincorporated into the production of new products. Um, so I have here a couple zero waste tips for everyone. Um, the first one is allow for enough time to plan exhibition events and artworks resourcefully and efficiently to reduce waste. This has to be the most important planning um, and rethinking and redesigning from the get-go reduces a tremendous amount of waste. A lot of waste, a lot of you know, last-minute purchases and last-minute transports by air can be avoided by proper planning. Um, always question if you need something new. Um, consuming new materials, new products, uh, this oftentimes is not necessary. Uh, we can look into our communities. Uh, there's online material sharing platforms among museums, you know, that you can get in touch with other museums and share exhibition furniture, vitrines, lighting, uh, electrical equipment. So who else uh, can use this as well? If you in your institution have these materials that are sitting in, these, in, the, in the storage and not in use, who can use these? Are there artists in your community that could potentially use these? Uh, so start a chat group with other conservators, museums, galleries in your area for material sharing and um, reuse. As I said, if, if there's not one available, maybe start your own. Uh, so look into online material share. Yeah, this is why I've already said this. Um, before discarding used or damaged products, look into local organizations that offer repair and repurposing services. Uh, hopefully these will become more abundant in the near future. Uh, as we are moving into a circular economy. So replace single-use plastics with non-fossil fuel-derived multiple-use materials, home compostable materials only if you compost at home, um, or curbside recyclable materials, meaning it's picked up from your local waste um, services. So I'm going to take a sip of water. Hold on. Um, bubble wrap. <laughs> In the key book, we also provide tips to prolong the life of plastic materials that we use in cultural heritage and offered some potential alternatives. So this will also undergo an update um, with results from various testing for both performance and material compatibility. So something that I really want to impress in the new edition of the key book is the recycling myth. Right, that plastic recycling isn't as commonplace as we've been led to believe. Um, so I'm sure you, some of you at least, have heard the stat that only eight to nine percent of all plastics ever manufactured have been recycled. And here are some fun plastic facts for you all to um, digest. <laughs> so less than uh, by, by 2050, there will be more plastic by weight than fish in the ocean. Um, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is now larger than France, Germany, and Spain combined. And plastic production is expected to triple by 2050. Um, humans ingest a credit card's worth of microplastics every week. So alternatives to 
petrochemical plastic packaging material. So as I mentioned, um, there are updates to these alternative materials, such as mycelium foam, uh, bioplastic packaging materials like PLA. Uh, in the past three years, they have been vetted and tested by conservators and art handlers. Um, but there's one aspect to some of these materials, especially the bioplastics, that definitely require further clarification. And that is, so there's so-called compostable plastics on the market. So many of these bioplastics are marketed as compostable, um, which is a example, unfortunately, of greenwashing. Um, so these eco-friendly bioplastic products made from PLA or polylactic acid claim to be certified 100% compostable. But this particular material requires industrial composting to degrade. And these facilities do not accept compostable plastics. Um, instead, they are typically incinerated or sent to landfill. So when thrown away in a regular trash bin, PLA does not compost and behaves as any other traditional plastic that ends up in a landfill. Uh, compostable plastics, as I mentioned previously, additionally don't add any nutrients to the compost, which is why they're sorted out. Um, these facilities uh, add them to mixed waste. Um, and as I mentioned, the, they degrade slowly in landfill and release methane gas, which is a more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, up to 80% or 80 times more potent. Um, another issue with PLA is that it's often confused with other recyclable plastics and contaminates the plastic recycling stream, which isn't that strong anyhow. Um, so I personally am not a big proponent of PLA being used in our consumer products and also in cultural heritage. Um, they can also even have a larger carbon footprint than fossil fuel derived plastics. And again, I want to really impress that these plastics don't magically dissolve when discarded in the trash bin and definitely cannot be composted in home compost. Um, a PLA bottle could take anywhere from 100 to 1,000 years to decompose in a landfill. Um, and then you also see here, this is a very misleading logo. Um, it looks like a uh, you know, little, little plant budding um, very, very, very eco-friendly. So this is the logo for the industrial compost. Uh, this does not mean it's compostable at home or, again, um, it's not going to compost in a landfill. Uh, and there's also the criticism of bioplastics that they use, typically corn, in their production. Uh, and this is, a, this is a viable food source. This is a food crop. Um, so you know, again, it's, it's taking away a viable crop that could be used to feed people to make products for the developed world. Um, so there's often criticism about that. We also have to think about um, crops, you know, monocrops, biodiversity, deforestation to make room for, for these crops. Uh, so these are all issues with bioplastics and in particular PLA that uh, is worth noting because um, it's one of these issues uh, after having looked at materials for so long, when I first started my research, I was really hoping for the silver bullet, as we say. I was hoping for materials that would solve all of our problems um, and we could just instantaneously become more sustainable by using these products. And it turns out there's no silver bullet. Um, all of these materials have environmental burdens. Uh, there's different issues in their waste disposal, uh, nothing's being recycled, and really the only, the only path forward is reducing, is reducing the amount of these materials, reusing materials that we have, not throwing materials away. Um, that is really the only, quote, sustainable pathway forward. Um, but I'm going to now take you on a little journey through some paper-based packaging materials. Uh, as I mentioned, um, you know, I'm not a proponent of bioplastics, uh, traditional plastics. There's issues as well in their toxicity and their production, um, affecting marginalized communities in the world. Uh, they're not disposed of property, properly. So what can we use in cultural heritage? Uh, paper is not, again, everything has a burden. And you know, there's chemicals used in paper recycling as well. 
but I see um, paper-based packaging materials as um, a potential, a, a potential uh, not solution, but mitigating um, decision in our, our uh, in cultural heritage. Um, so there's some paper-based packaging materials on the market that, um, you know, again, we're conservators here. We know when to run risk assessment. Um, so when they're applicable and suitable for an object, uh, I, I encourage the use of paper-based packaging materials. Um, so it's a potential replacement for bubble wrap and polyfoams. Um, however, you know, this depends on the sensitivities of the object and, of course, the time frame uh, for the transport. So, you know, the paper products don't really have the same shock and vibration absor absorption as their foam and plastic counterparts. Um, and again, we have to run risk assessments uh, in, you know, with, in the decision making of using these, these products. And then, of course, as we know, uh, paper is acidic uh, and will become more, uh, more acidic over time and is not for use with materials that are susceptible to acidic environments uh, and also in long-term transport and storage if there are materials that are sensitive to, uh, to acids. Um, so this is honeycomb cardboard. Uh, I was working with White Cube Gallery in London. They uh, you know, not, not faulting museums, but the galleries I work with at Gallery Climate Coalition, they don't have a board of directors. They don't have people that they need to go through. They, they, they start using materials right away. There's not a lag in testing materials. Um, so it's been very interesting working with both galleries and museums because the galleries are much faster to make decisions and to try, try certain um, new methods and uh, so White Cube Gallery was using this honeycomb cardboard and they set up mock crates and put loggers for temperature and relative humidity inside. Um, and they also put loggers in a crate with polyethylene foam and there wasn't any difference in the temperature and RH uh, as, far as, as far as they could tell. Um, you know, we also look at the honeycomb. It's not, it's not the same as, as a, as a polyfoam. Um, they've been using this for over a year now and have not had any issues with it. But again, this is more commercial art. If, if, there, if shock and vibration is an issue for artworks or for cultural, uh, um, heritage artifacts, then of course we can't maybe use this honeycomb cardboard in the same capacity. Oh. Um, and this is an example. This is a, a friend of mine, an artist in Berlin, and she makes these large-scale ceramic pieces, which you can see in the, in the right-hand corner, and was essentially just wrapping them in cotton and using a shredded paper uh, packaging material to ship her artwork. Uh, and, you know, the issue with, with cotton, other than, you know, it's hygroscopic, is that there's uh, lint that can obviously deposit on the surface if it's rough. Uh, so of course, you know, any any time we're thinking about using alternative packaging materials, there's always, again, the risk assessment. It's a case by case um, thing. You know, there's no blanket. There's no blanket solutions. There's no blanket packaging systems that work for everything. It has to be decided case by case. But luckily, you know, our training as as conservators then you know allows us to to make these decisions. Uh, with confidence. Um, these are interesting. These are these air-filled paper cushions. Um, there has been some pushback with these. Uh, there's been concern that they will pop if there's a shock to the crate. Um, also, there is concern that they deflate over time. So if you pack an artwork with these air cushions and the air deflates out of the um, the paper, then you're left with a, an object that's not protected in the crate. Um, but there are creative uses to these materials as well. So Earth Crate, uh, which is a, I don't know if I, I should have included a photo of Earth Crate. It's a crate out of America that's 
entirely made from like um, reinforced cardboard. So it's cardboard layered and they only use starch adhesives. Um, they use the cornstarch packing foam and they decided to use the, um, the air cushions, the paper air cushions, not as protection for shock and absorption, but more to, you know, f um, as a space filler in the, in the, in the packaging of, of uh, various artworks. So um, this is how they've been using this, this product. And then redesigning crates. So this is a, I have, you guys are familiar with this um, image. So this is the, the ungodly amount of polyurethane foam packing one of Olafer's works from, was it 2018? I can't remember. Um, and we started in the studio working on thinking about redesigning the crates. So this is, again, part of the uh, circular economy in the sense of like you design the waste out before you create the waste. So the new packing system at the studio was um, same artworks using wooden braces with thin sheets of polyethylene foam. Uh, there's some paper cushions. These are filled with, um, with shredded paper and then a craft paper as a dust cover to, to the artwork. And you know, just by looking at this in comparison, uh, you know, the amount of these foams is just like minimized um, from this packing technique. Uh, so it's always a matter of like trying to rethink how can you pack something, can you use braces, can you use um, ties instead of, instead of tape. You know, there's, there's you know, tons of creative solutions uh, in this sense. Um, so this is a product that I, I'm a big fan of. Um, you know, aside from the fact that producing new products isn't necessarily the best, best way forward, but uh, in comparison to using a polyfoam, uh, this is a 100% cellulose-based um, paper foam, they call it, it's called papira, and it's produced from, from quick-growing timber in Scandinavia and is 100%, there's no additives to it, and there's, it's 100% recyclable with paper. Um, of course, you can use it over and over again. It's not on the market yet, but I've been in contact with the company and trying to test its applicability in cultural heritage. Um, and of course, White Cube Gallery, my, my friends at White Cube Gallery, who are so, so keen to test these materials, it's so nice working with them. Um, they received some samples of the papira and tested it against plastizote uh, in the same thickness. Um, you can see this plastizote on the, uh, on the left and papira on the right. Um, one issue with this foam, I do have to say, is that when you when it's compressed, it doesn't have the same it doesn't have the same resiliency as polyfoams. But I'm a strong believer that we can find uses for for any any of these materials. Um, again, it also has to do with creative thinking. Uh, so uh, White Cube carried out some drop tests with the papira, dropping it with a mock frame from various heights. And you can see the, in the first test, the papira compresses a little bit. Um, and then they decided to put a thin sheet of cardboard over it to see if that helped in any way. Um, and it compressed in the opposite, opposite manner, in the inverse manner. Um, but they dropped these frames by up to a meter uh, high. And, and the frames, nothing, you know, the frames survived the fall. And uh, again, these, maybe this requires testing with dynamic cushioning curves and you know, in, a, in a lab setting. But my fear is they're not gonna pass these tests that we have in place for cultural heritage artifacts and objects because our standards are for the, you know, we use, we use a blanket sort of standardization for the most uh, sensitive and susceptible objects and apply it to everything. And we need to sort of move away from this line of thinking. Um, I can talk about that in, in one moment. Uh, 
glazine, uh, which is also just spun bound cellulose. There's no additives. It's water resistant. It's grease resistant. Um, you know, it was used in the past. I know it sticks to some paint surfaces, uh, in particular oil painted surfaces. And, uh, you know, again, it's not, not a one-to-one -one equivalent replacement for Tyvek and Mylar. However, I'm working with the National Trust right now in the UK on a project looking into sustainable soft wrapping for historical paintings. And we were testing various bioplastics, which again, I'm not a huge fan of, um, but also recycled content plastic films. Uh, and I encouraged that we test glazine in the same manner. And it turns out glazine is terrible at buffering relative humidity. Um, it did not stand up to its plastic counterparts. But instead of completely writing um, glazine off, I encourage National Trust to look at their collection and divide it into susceptible and non-susceptible to our age. You know, so artworks that are very susceptible to changes in relative humidity and need that buffering capability from a material, you can use the recycled content plastic. Um, however, if the artwork is a bit more robust and doesn't need the same RH buffering um, uh, as, as the more sensitive ones, you can use the glazine. Uh, so it's about, you know, again, like not overcomplicating, but maybe in collections, um, dividing them up into various categories and having, having different handling processes and packaging processes for these, these uh, uh, objects and artifacts. Um, and of course, uh, I would have to mention the reusable materials and crates that are on the market. There's rock box for crating, there's turtle. Um, these have been proven in tests by stitch. Um, the, they are you know, lighter weight. They produce less CO2 than wooden crates. Uh, they have a very, very long lifespan. Yes, they are made of plastic, but um, the company also offers if anything is to ever go wrong with them, they will replace these materials um, and replace the components. And then I also see often uh, moving blankets and reusable sort of envelopes. This is, I guess, more in the commercial sort of art sector. Um, however, I was working at the RCE in the Netherlands uh, last year, and they are, have developed their own reusable blanket uh, for moving objects to and from their storage. Um, so that's also an option too. Again, it's creative thinking. They have, you know, instead of just a moving blanket, they have it lined with various material, and there's Velcro, Velcro straps. Uh, so there are creative ways, again, to, um, to implement reusable materials into uh, the storage and transport of cultural heritage objects. So often, you know, I mean, you know, I'm, you guys, I think, were expecting me to get to this point. We can't use paper for everything. There are certain artworks and objects that require traditional, our traditional um, um, archival packaging materials. But this is another example of redesigning a crate um, where it uses less of this material. So uh, on, the, on the left, this is from 2017. It's basically, this artwork is in a crate that's just is completely lined with foam, covered in Tyvek. Uh, there was foam on the lid of the crate. Uh, and then, you know, the question is, do we need that much of this material? And then on the right, you have uh, the redesigned version of the crate, where it's using, again, wooden braces with, that can also be reused in the future for other objects. Um, wooden, uh, wooden braces lined with, with thin sheets of foam, and then like a small piece of foam on the bottom. So again, moving forward, uh, when we have to use traditional uh, plastic packaging materials, like can, can we use less of them? And also find ways to reuse them. So th the decision-making guidelines for materials. Um, so the most impactful action is keeping materials in use for as long as possible. Uh, I'm gonna continue saying this till I'm, I'm you know, red in the face. It's, it really is the, the best thing we can do. Um, 
when sourcing materials, when you have to find new materials, uh, opt for reclaimed materials or materials with recycled content. Um, and of course, purchase from local manufacturers. I know it's, it's difficult. Um, it's not always possible, but it's worth doing a quick little search to see where your materials are being produced. Um, you know, prioritize a low carbon footprint, but the carbon footprint is not the only consideration. Um, this is something that uh, I, I've noticed in the past few years in conversations in sustainability, we've hyper-focused on the carbon footprint, and of course, it's very, very important. Um, however, there's other environmental burdens that come with materials. Uh, materials are more nuanced. There's you know, human toxicity in the production uh, and in the use of these materials. Uh, the end-of-life management of the materials is also a very important aspect. And of course, there's humanitarian and social impacts. Um, we live in a very exploitative, extractive society. Um, you know, and, and, and even thinking about the sustainability goals of, you know, of not impacting future generations, I always question who are these generations? These, you know, it seems like highly focused on maintaining a way of, of life for developed countries at the expense of, of underdeveloped countries. Um, and it's not an issue for the future, it's our reality now. Uh, so again, this is, can be combated by doing a, you know, research into where your materials are coming from, um, switching to materials that are not extractive, that are not employing, uh, you know, um, uh, slave labor and workshops, um, um, and then yeah, again, just re keeping things in, in use and not purchasing stuff new. Uh, but again, with the environmental burdens, there's the reduction of solid waste and reusability and recyclability. Again, the last possible thing that we can do. Um, curbside of the materials is something else that we should consider when when choosing materials. So, but what else can you do? <laughs> Um, of course, be mindful and ask questions. Challenge your assumptions. So this uh, engages critical thinking. You need to question everything. This is, uh, you know, um, something I'm, I'm, I'm hearing again and again from from all of us working in sustainability. Is just to question everything. Uh, new information is coming out constantly. And no one's, no one's an expert, you know, there aren't really experts in this field. Uh, so just question everything. Step outside our comfort zones and challenge the status quo. And of course, educate yourself. And this is where, oh yeah, also, sorry. <laughs> Question, so why are, we, why are we doing what we're doing? Um, how are we doing it and who are we doing it for? Um, so this is where uh, Key Futures comes into play. So it's one thing to hand someone a book or a manual with guidelines, but it's another to actually implement these actions. So these are the components of the Key Futures programs. Um, it's, so making sustainability um, sustainable and accessible and achievable. Um, it's an international program. You know, we have museums and uh, universities uh, from all over the world involved in the program. It's very holistic. It's, a, it's a, a approaching sustainability, not just from environmental um, aspects, but also social sustainability and um, diversity, diversity and inclusion. Uh, so there's a training uh, aspect to this program. Um, there's coaching, there's networking. It's a never ending journey. Again, this is, uh, you know, there's no end point, I often say there's no so real solutions um, in sustainability. It's, you know, we're working towards, towards uh, um, you know, negotiations that are more beneficial uh, to everyone in the planet. Um, so it's a never ending journey. Uh, there's a support system online. Um, it supports research and education. There's different, uh, I'll, we're going to go through some case studies in a little bit. And it's, uh, it's a way to connect with people who are also working on the same issues that you're working on in sustainability. Um, yeah, so the program consists of weekly live online events. There's a uh, online hub called the Keyport where members post their 
reports on what they're doing, articles, questions. It's just a way to connect with everyone. Uh, you have support from a key coach. Um, I sometimes am a key coach in the program, so I was working with museums in Belgium, um, also the Smithsonian in the States, and we would have meetings online to discuss uh, their sustainability initiatives, and, and I would help them in you know, achieving these. Uh, so, so it's a project-based mentorship. Um, and again, it's international networking. It's really nice to connect with, with people from all over the world who are working on sustainability and cultural heritage. Mm. So this is uh, one case study. Um, the Museo Moderno in Buenos Aires uh, opened up its doors to the homeless community. Um, so people were experiencing homelessness, were invited to come inside and make art. Uh, the works were then displayed and sold, offering co-creation, community support, and economic resources for the community. Um, Nevada Museum of Art, this is also something that uh, what they achieved in key futures. They realized 90% of their collections are in storage. Um, most museums then you know, borrow art from around the world, creating like new and novel exhibitions. And this leads to, of course, massive carbon emissions from transportation and waste from the packaging. Uh, so to address this, Nevada committed to utilizing their own art first and taking at least 50% of works for new exhibitions from their own collection. So that is their policy moving forward. Um, here's another case study from the National Museum Lagos. Um, um, Ode, who's an art conservator um, at the museum, conducted research on ambient climate um, for storage and exhibition. Um, and her conclusion essentially was that, um, that yeah, of course, ambient not using climate controls, uh, you know, sustainable, it reduces energy and running costs, um, and the thermo hygrometric parameters are a matter of context, so it's based on a local climate, um, and the research supports the guidelines of the IIC and ICOM CC released in 2004 for climatic conditions. So this was, um, you know, something that was also achieve the research through the Key Futures program. Um, and recently, uh, Key Futures rolled out our Getting Climate Under C Control pilot program to address this issue of climate control and advocate change in museums. Um, so the goals and outcomes uh, is to collectively reduce the carbon footprint of the cultural sector. Uh, to showcase and address climate control for museums around the world and produce case studies from a variety of museums and then um, and inevitably to produce a methodology for museums globally. So there's data collection and transparency is a huge issue as well. Uh, we encourage the transparency um, among, among energy use and uh, transport burdens from, from all of our, our uh, key futures members, and there's no, there's no finger wagging or judging. The whole point is we're, we're hoping to improve these uh, over time. And then another huge aspect to this is rewriting loan agreements. Um, oftentimes, um, the loan agreements stipulate a very particular and narrow climate control for objects that are being borrowed. And this, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's causing issues because uh, museums that don't have climate controls or want to move away from having climate controls and exhibition spaces are not able to borrow works um, that have these climate controls. And oftentimes it's unnecessary, especially if it's not organic materials. Um, there's recently been a uh, project with the Danish associations of museums. Um, and they were bringing the, the Getting Climate Control Under Control project to Denmark. So the program launched in May, and they are working with 10 museums on updating their conditions um, and developing a follow-up program which will help all museums in Denmark go through a update in their climate control parameters. And very exciting news, one of the Danish museums already saved 50% on their energy bill six months into the pilot program, uh, which is, yeah, astounding. You know, it's, it's 
it's uh, you know obviously it's it's saving money, but also you know it's it's how having the carbon emissions um, from the energy use. So it's it's very exciting that the the pilot's actually actually working, and um, yeah, it's it's I hope we hope to to have more museums reach that. Uh, and lastly, you know, there's another, you know, some more tangible things too, other than reducing the transport of artworks and reducing climate control, is to reduce the data. Um, so we are consuming data at an exponential rate so fast that even if we would switch to 100% renewable energy today, we, wouldn't, we couldn't build an, um, new energy plants fast enough to keep up with our demand, which is why we have to start with reducing um, you know, we all know emails consume energy, so every time you stream a song or a movie, you are using energy. And not just the energy from your device, but energy from data centers, uh, where all of this information is stored. Um, so how can we address this? Uh, deleting old emails is one way to do this. I know I need to go through, I have an old email account with like thousands of emails. Um, it's, uh, I, think it's, I think it's a task for the holidays. It's something to do over the holidays with, with some, you know, some, some Irish coffee in hand and just, just go for it. You know, just go, go, go into it, delete the old emails. Um, unsus, uns, unsubscribe from newsletters uh, is also something we can do. And then download our songs and films and TV shows first and then watch them as opposed to streaming. Um, and then when you're sending emails, send links instead of attachments. Uh, it takes up a massive amount of, of um, energy and also even just the little, our sign-offs at the, at the end of our emails, the images, all of this, um, you know, if oftentimes what I do is I, my first email to someone, I keep it and then once they know who I am and where I'm from and who I work for, I, I start deleting it to reduce um, the, the data of that email. So. That is it, and thank you all very much for your attention. Um, I look forward to talking to you all in the, during the coffee break. Any questions, um, happy to answer. And uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, we're going to get started with this uh, second part of today's session. So we will move on now to uh, introduce you to Sonia Nunez Thespeda, who is the head coordinator for the registry of the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, when the organizing and scientific committee of this Congress uh, designed the program, we thought it was important for us to uh, rely on the presence here today of a pioneering centre in terms of sustainability, such as the Guggenheim Museum. They have impl been implementing actions in this uh, direction for many years now, and at the moment they have a very ambitious uh, project, that is uh, the one that Son is going to be talking about here today. And we feel that this is an example for everyone to follow. She's worked in a number of registry departments of many organizations, uh, most of them related to Guggenheim. And as you, uh, uh, well, you already know who she is. And I would like to just welcome her for coming to Pontevedra and for giving us the opportunity to exchange ideas with you and to raise awareness about this issue. And I hope that your stay in front of it is going to be very nice. Thank you. You have the floor. OK, good morning to all of you. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. And I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me, the um, Provincial Council of Pontevedra and the Pontevedra Museum. We at the Guggenheim Museum are working to become a more sustainable institution. And I'm going to share with you here today uh, our efforts, our experience, our expertise in terms of sustainability uh, with a view to the management of uh, collections and exhibitions. In 2021, we included sustainability as one of the pillars of the strategic plan for 2021-2023. One of these seven pillars was uh, established as a commitment to environmental sustainability. Behind this pillar is our intention to minimize environmental impact 
on the museum activity and also the implementation of sustainably uh, sustainable energy solutions and also the inclusion of non-polluting processes, therefore promoting an eco-efficient activity. We can see that within the framework of the seven pillars, we have uh, implemented a number of uh, processes, activities, solutions, and as a consequence of this strategic plan, what we created was a strategic framework for uh, environmental sustainability. So this uh, strategic framework is uh, made up of uh, nine axes. Three of them are cross-sectional that go beyond the activity of the museum. And it is an ambitious plan, including innovative actions in a number of different fields, such as energy management, uh, exhibition programming, public programs. And the goal behind this is to produce, progressively reduce, gradually reduce uh, carbon footprint and reaching 2030 with a uh, carbon footprint that is as small as possible. This framework has been planned uh, with the uh, SDGs in mind. According to the Agenda 2030 of the United Nations, as uh, Marian Reyes has already uh, said, uh, the SDGs is, are a guide for a sustainable future to eradicate poverty, to end poverty, to protect the planet and to ensure prosperity for all people. Organizations can therefore uh, full, uh, contribute to the fulfillment of the SDGs through these 17 goals and 169 specific purposes within the framework of these 17 uh, goals. Uh, we have uh, established our uh, work in connection with the environment and sanitation and clean water, uh, sustainable cities and communities, and responsible consumption and production, and also clean water and sanitation, climate action, and also life on land. Uh, firstly, what we did was to uh, create a working group that we call the Green Team, that is called Go Zero, which in uh, the Basque language means we zero, we zero emissions. So we try to involve those who are interested and all the departments that can make a contribution to this uh, goal. It is not a uh, 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 I mean, it's a flexible, a dynamic group. It can change in terms of members depending on the programs that are implemented. Where, in spite of the fact that it's not directly connected to the exhibitions and connections, it's also impo it's important to highlight the fact that, well, I'm going to summarize some of the departments that are in included for you to see what are the programs and initiatives that are being implemented. For example, communication since April this year, in the website of the museum, you can find a specific uh, uh, section for sustainability with a view to communicate communicating and conveying to our colleagues in other museums, our communities, our, the friends of the Guggenheim community, all the steps that have been taken in this direction because we are more and more aware of this um, curatorial. Uh, in October, we created an exhibition by Marina Ogonier which is focused on nature from all points of view, handling of nature, with two points of view, handling of nature and dependence on nature. In our publications and marketing campaigns, we use some uh, flags, some uh, banners that uh, play the role of a tree. They sort of clean the air. This is what we call photocatalysis, and we use these for the roof of the museum and also uh, and the facade of the museum where we announce the exhibitions and also the uh, banners and flags that are around the city and that invite people to visit um, the museum. In terms of education, we develop a number of public programs, uh, summer uh, training courses. Um, also, we organize um, biometric walks. Uh, this uh, is from Bios and Messis, that is uh, life in nature uh, through imitation. We're going to look at what nature offers and we invite people to reflect on what processes can be helpful in this regard. We also organize green routes for um, young people and we let people visit our permanent collection uh, uh, presentations and we invite people to actually reflect on sustainability and nature. Uh, 
in terms of the functions of this group that is uh, called GU0, we uh, have the following uh, functions to define a yearly program with a number of steps, initiatives and projects and also the goals that are associated with these projects. Uh, we do a follow-up of the sustainability program, including the follow-up of the implementation of projects, the analysis of ideas with a view to identify new projects and initiatives, and also to develop or modify the ones that have been established already. And also a yearly uh, assessment of the degree of fulfillment of the goals we set for ourselves in the framework of this uh, environmental sustainability program. I'm going to introduce you to a number of initiatives that we have been developing or implementing in the field of uh, uh, exhibition management and permanent collections. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing in terms of transport, in terms of courier work, uh, packaging work, um, environmental conditions within their galleries, etc. So, as uh, something that is uh, new to us in 2021 through this strategic uh, framework that I've uh, mentioned already, so in 2021 we conducted a measurement. We measured the footprint of Scope 3, Scope 3 uh, footprint, including the transport of artworks. In 2021 we measured the footprints of 2019 and 2020, but we all know that 20 is not uh, significant due to the uh, COVID pandemic. So we focused on 2019 as a benchmark year, as a baseline year. The total footprint of the museum is uh, more than 3,000 tons. Scope 1, I mean gas combustion, accounts for more than 1,000 tons. Scope 2, uh, 1,200. Uh, Artwork transport is less than half uh, the previous ones, uh, a little bit over 500 tons. This measurement has been audited by a company that's called A Test, and then it's been analyzed by INOR, which, as you know, is the Spanish Association for Standardization and Certification. As a consequence of this uh, assessment, uh, we have uh, consolidated a number of initiatives and we have implemented new actions for the measurement of the footprint, carbon footprint. And uh, this takes us to 2011. We see that uh, in terms of artwork transport for Scope 3, there is a great decrease. This is because we have uh, exhibitions where we um, higher local uh, construction services. This has a great impact in terms of transport, uh, packaging, courier uh, services, and this is something we can see on this graph. And if we compare 2019 and 2021, we see that uh, gradually we include elements. Okay, so that lets us see that we are including new things, new elements every year. So in 2021, apart from the transport of artworks, we start measuring a packaging. In the case of museographic elements, we start measuring uh, the transport and use of these elements too. And we try to be more and more um, comprehensive. Uh, so. Or on a yearly basis, we uh, include new elements such as the measurement of the collection because earlier we measured mm, the parameters associated with mm, the exhibition, but now we measure para parameters connected to the collection too. And we also measure in terms of the transport of works of art, the whole route, the whole route of the transport. If one truck has to uh, go from Madrid to Pamplona to uh, collect a, an artwork and then to Bilbao, it is not uh, Pamplona Bilbao, it is Madrid, Pamplona Bilbao, the whole route. And if the truck goes back to Madrid afterwards, well, we measure that part of the carbon footprint too. And this is a very recent information. It is the measurement of the carbon footprint uh, for 2022. We celebrated the 25th anniversary, so the mm, museum was full with uh, uh, Guggenheim collections. But, well, we could think that this is a very local thing to do. Uh, I mean, uh, proximity uh, processes. 
Uh, but there is an exhibition that is going to include, I mean, is going to cause a great carbon footprint. So what we have included this year is an analysis and assessment of all exhibitions. And we can see that there is one that uh, is uh, 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 greater than the rest in terms of um, emissions and that is an automobile um, uh, exhibition that required uh, vehicles to be transported from the other uh, side of the ocean so this has, uh, this translates into a greater carbon footprint that but the, this helps us uh, reflect on what we want for the future another thing that we are doing or that we have done in cooperation with our uh, colleagues from the transportation services because every time we get a, a, an invoice uh, whether it is related to a, a competition uh, or whether it's related to a budget when there is a certain amount connected to transport well we mm, uh, um, organize a competition, a bid, a tender, and we ask uh, transporters to, uh, well, at this uh, table that we can see on the image that is intended to um, gather objective information without the involvement of the a museum. This is uh, supervised or uh, reviewed together with the uh, transport uh, service uh, providers and then we have an audit process just to make things as clear and objective as possible so in these tables you can see three blocks one of them is transport and then we've got a uh, courier and then we have uh, uh, creating creating shipping and couriers so we uh, specify the type of route whether it is uh, uh, airborne transport or marine transport uh, or land transport and also the size and weight of the crates and um, also whether it is soft packing whether it is a museum type crate whether it is a crate that has been manufactured specifically for this and in the case of couriers uh, we uh, uh, verify whether I mean, all the parameters related to uh, couriers, where this is coming from, uh, it's uh, stopped here or there, what is the route uh, that has been covered. And then we add a percentage because if it's a case of a, a co organization with the Pompidou Museum from Paris and we have a, a goods being brought to Bilbao, then we have a shipping process that is paid by both of us according to the contract and uh, the carbon footprint is divided between the two when there is a project uh, like this that is co-organized by two museums another important element that we have included uh, as an improvement is the following within the framework of the public tenders that i have been talking about we attach uh, points to good practices or we value good practices so this can vary from uh, a process to another uh, process and we can just include this uh, in the root program or in the uh, material uh, assets we are mm, considering the possibility of giving points to the transport fleet that's going to provide the service whether it is an a type truck or an eco truck a number of points uh, are given as a score to the ones that are less polluting and we also assess uh, procedures uh, good practices the use of energies uh, of energy by the vendor and we uh, based on these tables try to assess whether companies are more um, environmentally friendly and sustainable and these are the ones that are going to be um, uh, well uh, getting uh, more points another topic in connection with uh, the handling and management of collections and exhibitions is packaging in terms of crates 
its uh, or their function is to protect uh, artworks while they're being transported or stored and to design a crate for uh, an artwork requires some time normally if it's a collection artwork uh, we gather the assembly team and handling team who are the ones who are in charge of transporting uh, artworks and also conservation and registering so we design the crate everybody gives their opinion and we uh, agree on how to uh, design that crate by taking into consideration many factors but we try to make these uh, crates for artworks uh, uh, affordable because they're very expensive more often than not and in uh, exhibitions when the artwork is sent back to uh, the person who owns uh, it uh, we I mean uh, the packaging is destroyed and packaging might have metallic parts plastic parts that are very difficult to destroy that are polluting and that uh, are not included in a, a good practice or best practice policy. So we try to uh, attach priority to the use of existing, pre-existing crates by renting them or by reusing them. In terms of, uh, in the case of uh, collections, this is easier because we might uh, 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 loan or, I mean, other museums might borrow uh, artworks from us. We have recently borrowed uh, or a, a, a museum from Barcelona borrowed some artworks from us, so we used a transport framework that, I mean, a crate that we had already used before. Also at the national level, we have used a number of otezas that involved the use of a, 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 a pre-existing crate, but we did some changes in the inside of the crate. So. My things might get complicated sometimes, but we have introduced changes in our borrowing uh, agreement, and we have included this sentence. Uh, for a more sustainable, I mean, does the artwork have a shipping crate? If no, for a more sustainable plant, would you approve a rental crate? I mean, uh, if you want, uh, to protect the planet well this is what you have to do and we have had a very positive reaction to build a crate is going to depend to a great extent on the type of artwork the technique the um, transport route but uh, the reaction that we're getting uh, is uh, being more and more positive in terms of the use of rental crates in the Miro exhibition more than 24 percent of crates were rented and this i th this is something very positive and we have to thank the owners of the artworks for this. Uh, there's a lot to do. It is true that uh, depending on the country, it might be easier to get this uh, rental crate service. And this is a teamwork that we all have to promote uh, and we all have to support and promote these good practices. Curious. During the COVID pandemic in 2020, what happened was that we had artworks uh, from our museum and that we were borrowing from other museums and people could not move from place to place. Uh, couriers could not travel, so they uh, looked for alternatives to be able to assemble, disassemble, and for artworks to be able to be transported. So uh, they started working in a mode that is called uh, virtual uh, couriering uh, or virtual courier or digital courier. So this was mm, possible thanks to technologies. And an alternative working mode has been uh, developed, uh, making assembling and disassembling easier, reducing the number of couriers and uh, uh, turning into an, uh, a positive, uh, an economically positive um, factor. So this technology has helped us to uh, work, uh, has enabled us to work remotely. We think that we have had positive results and there are many different options where I am showing a number of images. This is an example of a artwork that has been transported uh, on a truck and there is a camera in the crate and you can check the images of that uh, uh, camera and you can just make sure that everything is in order. So this is even better than being on board on the in the truck because the box is actually sealed or the crate is actually sealed and you can look inside but through this camera you can uh, check the status of the no 
of the artwork at all times and in real time. Here we can see a number of processes of assembling and disassembling, disassembling and processes such as the, mm, the load and the unloading, the loading and the unloading in an unloading station of the work of art. Uh, in spite of the fact that you are, well, uh, people who are conservation professions are going to recommend you a website that is ACS, the uh, Association of American Registries, and uh, for, it's for free. You can access a section for free that is called Resources. We have worked in the group of couriers uh, uh, on a number of initiatives. One of them is the tool that we call it. Uh, tree that is a tree tool that enables us to make decisions on couriers because uh, often we sort of uh, hesitate whether we should uh, resort to a courier or not but this is supposed to be a contribution for the organization to uh, make decisions on whether they're going to be using physical couriers or not so this is connected to concerns that the museum <coughs> might have when it comes to uh, have uh, well, uh, assets borrowed, uh, the root accesses of the uh, receiving museum uh, and other uh, issues. So this tool is intended to help the institution that is going to be, uh, well, lending its uh, uh, assets. And also technologies that we're going we're working with for virtual couriers. So this is connected to a survey that was uh, conducted with many museums that explained what technologies that were used and uh, whether they uh, thought that this was a positive thing to use or that it could be uh, improved, or whether it was good enough or whether it could be improved. Another important thing is lighting. In terms of lighting, we at the um, Guggenheim Museums are working in two directions. On the one hand, we're working on the replacement of halogen lights by a new uh, LED technology. Um, in terms of uh, the LED technology, we have replaced the original lamps of the museum with this new technology. It wasn't easy to uh, align the wish to work with uh, LED lights and the uh, appropriate moment in terms of development of this technology for the lighting of uh, works of art. After doing some research and some initial tests since 2010 to 2015, we confirmed that we verified that the LED technology had evolved uh, sufficiently to be able to uh, respond to the technical needs that our exhibition spaces uh, uh, faced. So this enabled us to change all the <laughs> lighting with uh, LED lights. This. Our main goals were to improve the quality of lighting, to increase the efficiency of our working processes, and to contribute to the sustainability, both economic and environmental, of the museum. So a public uh, tender was uh, uh, started, and the winning company was Zuntobel. It was a, an Austrian um, a company. The implementation process has taken three years from 2018 to 2021 for two main reasons. Because of two main reasons, the investment capacity near 1.3 million euros and uh, our will to tackle this process in a gradual way to write, program and install, uh, to design install and program all the equipment properly. The energy change has improved our uh, lighting quality and has enabled us to reduce the uh, damaging uh, factor and to use a light that is more similar to um, natural light and also to mitigate equipment in a uh, wireless way and in a uh, precise and instantaneous way. The life cycle of the new lighting um, equipment is around 30,000 hours, 20 times as many as the halogen uh, lamps. It consumes 8% of the energy that the original um, halogen system consumed. In terms of uh, savings, we have saved 200,000 euros per year, 170 in terms of uh, energy consumption reduction, and the rest in terms of, um, I mean, uh, maintenance uh, work. So this investment is going to be recovered in the next uh, five years. The reduction of the carbon footprint is around 8% of the total footprint of the museum. And we're going to move on now to another important part of lighting, uh, two blocks, and the other one is uh, sunlight. In the Guggenheim Museum, I don't know if, well, 
probably you have been there already. It is, I mean, sunlight or natural light is very important. There is a, a, a central space and there's some uh, windows letting light in. Uh, we have this light penetrating the gallery so around that uh, central space. In uh, 2022, we had uh, the 25th anniversary of the museum and the whole museum was filled with uh, artworks uh, from the Guggenheim collections and long-term uh, deposits. So, the curatorial department uh, decided to uh, um, revert the special interventions that have been implemented in the museum. So, we uh, r removed uh, temporary walls and we opened uh, windows, uh, going back to the vision that Gary had of the building. When we did this, uh, we opened a number of windows in the galleries, windows that hadn't been opened for many years, and uh, also measurements uh, in terms of the levels of light that were entering the walls were made, the walls for the paintings or the galleries themselves. But that was the time, uh, I mean, because we were celebrating the 25th anniversary, it was our own collection. So it was the time to do it. Uh, whenever it's been necessary, we have uh, installed a number of uh, elements in the windows that reduce uh, natural light by 68 percent. And we're working on a dynamic lighting project that is geared to installing a number of filters, mechanical light filters in our windows and to connect them uh, via Bluetooth with the LED system that I have already mentioned. Uh, this is uh, with a view to uh, maximize the use of natural light and at some points during the day to make uh, natural light get in these spaces and then to use a LED light and to continue reducing the consumption or the use of uh, electrical energy. So these changes is, uh, are complex and we estimate that we need to budget for next year because we've got different types and shapes of windows and each window has to be analyzed uh, one by one on a one by one basis and this change needs to be implemented during a moment when uh, we have a change of exhibitions. So this is uh, some sort of a summary. We've got two screens, one of them is opaque and the other one is not. And we uh, are working on this at the moment. We've been doing some research and analysis, and next year we're going to have a more comprehensive study to, uh, well, uh, decide whether we want to hire uh, a company to uh, take charge of this. Environmental conditions within galleries in 2014, the creation of uh, environmental guidelines of the IIC and the ICOMCC asked for the reviewing of the uh, rigorous standards that uh, we had in terms of environmental conditions in galleries, that is, temperature and relative humidity in the declaration. The IIC and the ICOM referred to uh, previous documents of the Visod Group, the group of um, museum uh, directors of the American Institute for Conservation and the Australian Institute for the Conservation of Cultural Material. And they asked for uh, humidity and temperature uh, ranges that were more flexible. And we at the Guggenheim Museum started discussing on uh, uh, on the reviewing of our temperature and humidity standards for the nearly 10,000 square meters that our galleries and collection occupy. Uh, and the moment to do this was 2022 because we had the uh, um, Guggenheim Collection Exhibition, so that was the perfect timing. And this is what we did. And by being consistent and by uh, uh, asking for the same kind of things that we offer, we have changed the facility report. This is a document where when you borrow a, uh, uh, an artwork, you tell the owners how your um, museum is, you tell them about safety, about humidity, about lighting, so that they are uh, assured that uh, their works are going to be fine. And one of the most important things in this facility report is the environmental conditions. So we can see the change here. In 2021, they talked about 21 uh, degrees centigrade and 50% uh, uh, plus minus 5% humidity. Uh, now we've gone from 21 uh, degrees centigrade 
plus uh, minus three. And in terms of hum relative humidity, we've gone from uh, 40 60 percent with a maximum fluctuation of uh, plus minus five percent in a 24 period within these parameters. <laughs> This has been important because we continue to do this and museums are accepting these conditions and it is true that some might require copies of the graphs for humidity and temperature in galleries but we have, we're not having any problems, this is working well and um, museums are accepting uh, these uh, conditions. Also, we are working well, it's also important to uh, highlight uh, some data in terms of what this change has involved. In terms of gas consumption, this has enabled us to reduce uh, the consumption of gas by 30%. In winter, 40%. And this uh, means that we've saved 100,000 euros. In terms of electricity use, 5.5% per year. That means that we have saved around 30,000 euros per year. Um, construction. So about construction, it's very important to consider construction within the framework of a museum. I'm going to be telling you about ephemeral, ephemeral construction and museographic elements. In terms of uh, construction reduction, we can see here two consecutive exhibitions in the same gallery, Krasner and Neil. As you can see, uh, ephemeral uh, architecture, this was uh, created for a specific uh, exhibition, are uh, kept for the following uh, exhibition, uh, save for a small wall. Um, so all our teams working in exhibitions work hand in hand to try and maximize the use of walls and the amount of walls that can be used and reused so this means that we are reducing the use of uh, raw materials and we also reduce uh, the carbon footprint. Uh, so this is an important step and we need to, uh, we all need to reach an agreement. Curators make a great effort to be able to accommodate the um, projects in the same spaces, on the same walls to avoid the need to destroy these elements and to remanufacture them. Uh, we also depend on not only the curators, but people who come to work in the museum, to designers or artists, and <laughs> their reaction has been quite positive. This is working very well, as you can see on the um, graphs, on the plans on the screen, and everybody is doing a very generous contribution, we could say. Another part of construction is museography, uh, pedestals, uh, platforms, uh, uh, showcases. So our goal is to share as much as possible this element uh, 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 from three points of view, uh, exhibitions and collections. The showcases are colored in blue that are used by the uh, education department and by other institutions, also other uh, uh, institutions that are near the uh, museum that might be interested in using these elements. In the uh, Mujeres de la Extracción exhibition, these uh, uh, platforms were used for education and also the 25th anniversary exhibition, also the motion exhibition used these elements in the Kokoska exhibition also used this. Uh, the uh, equipment used by the Guggenheim was um, uh, given to other institutions. It was reduced in the Recalde room, the Fine Arts University of the Basque Country, and the Art Center of uh, Bilbao, and many other institutions in the province. We are also working to make this even more uh, well organized. This is, uh, well, similar to the uh, Alparter platform 
for the sharing of museographic elements. We had the Gokanje Museum work with a tool for the management and handling of the collection and the exhibition. This is something that is shared by a number of museums in the Basque Country. This is called Insime and next year is going to be called Museo Tic. This is a tool that includes two different modules and we're also working to create a third module. The idea is to uh, launch this in November but we haven't been able to do this because this is associated with the presentation of the new uh, Tic Museum platform and we're working to make it possible for all of us museums that are included in this network and even those who are not in this network and there are, might not be Basque but they are uh, near the Basque country for us to be able to share these museographic elements and we are working on this and how we want to do this through well uh, photographs, sizes, who is going to ask for this, we're going to receive this, we're going to be transported, how to organize this properly but I think that this is going to be a step forward when it comes to uh, organizing things and to share this type of element. At the moment, the museum has an exhibition, which is the uh, Picasso as a sculpture, and this is a. We have had a cooperation with the Picasso Malaga, the Picasso Museum from Malaga. So in this exhibition, we have 29 uh, showcases that have been uh, shared by the two institutions. They have been transported together with their artworks. Uh, the cost has been shared by the two museums, and when the exhibition is over, they're going back to the Picasso Museum in Malaga so that they continue being used there. Another thing that I hadn't seen in the lending agreements and that we are starting to see these, and we have had uh, several examples in connection with the Picasso Museum, the owners of the works ask you for the showcases or um, the pedestals to be uh, formaldehyde free and this is established in the contract i had never seen this in a contract but now they've been included in contracts and this is being done uh, more and more often also in connection with my my colleagues from the design department well they are looking at new materials new elements in terms of uh, construction they have conducted a number of tests for the kokoska platforms for example and we continue doing research on this on uh, more biodegradable materials and biosustainable materials and we have used um, something that might be very useful for a number of exhibitions with very heavy artworks with painted walls and this is porous and uh, can get deformed it is flexible to a certain extent so we continue working on this with the Eracus company which is uh, a cooperator of uh, Guggenheim in the field of ephemeral construction so they're analyzing what type of paint can be used in galleries and they're always working on uh, developing more sustainable solutions in terms of collection let me just give you some hints. Uh, we have been working on this for 16 years, now, uh, 26 years now, but we can always have improvements. One of these elements is the Jeff comes poppy that is uh, in front of the museum. This is planted twice per year uh, for the summer and for the winter. And it includes an irrigation system. So this irrigation system, well, this belongs to the permanent collection of the museum, this artwork. So this irrigation system used to be activated manually by programming from a, uh, a central station, uh, this uh, uh, process, but it's uh, become obsolete, didn't allow a remote uh, programming or the opening valve opening and closing uh, procedures. So this is why since 2021 we've implemented an in, an smart irrigation system that can be controlled remotely from a PC, from a computer or from a mobile phone. Also, let me tell you that any uh, problem might be, I mean, can be detected. Uh, we get an alarm. We have installed uh, LED lighting and we have a, a, a rainfall uh, measurement uh, tool that uh, enables us to stop the daily irrigation process if it's rained or if it's raining and this means that we can save uh, a lot of well water in this uh, case so this is another step this is just another step in terms of promoting environmental sustainability another part of the uh, permanent collection is the fire uh, fountains exclaim 
Yves Klein fire fountain. So it used to be activated for one minute every five minutes. Now it is activated one minute every 15 minutes. So this uh, has uh, uh, translated into 66% less use of uh, energy. A small analysis in terms of the use of electricity. We've gone from 11 million kilowatts down, we've gone down to 4 million kilowatts. So this is strongly related to uh, changes in terms of the environmental conditions within the gallery, in spite of the fact that last year was very warm and the machines were activated all the time in the uh, summer and also this is connected to the issue of uh, lead lighting and this leads to improvement in terms of um, climatization uh, methods or, or equipment but at the end of the day this uh, leads us to uh, electricity reduction and uh, electricity can use reduction so all of this enables us to play a, a fundamental role uh, in terms of implementing positive actions that more often than not cannot be quantified, but that contribute to improve the environment of our planet. And last but not least, let me quote uh, Martin Luther King when he said that everything uh, is interrelated. We're all caught in a net. We're all uh, a part of the same uh, destiny uh, garment. Thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Sonia, for sharing with us that actually there are centers with data with some very rigorous uh, research. And now we will move on to the next speaker, Alejandro Silva, who comes from the support unit of the General Directorate of Cultural Heritage and Fine Arts of the Ministry of Culture and Sport. He has been working with museums uh, from the point of view of communication and dissemination. So we want to have uh, the, the view of a communications person. So he's going to introduce a very recent uh, volume published by the minister, which is a green book for the sustainable management of cultural heritage. I'd just like to thank you for coming. Um, the fact that the ministry is uh, present here in this meeting is uh, a reason to be proud of and I'm sure that the Green Book will be a useful tool uh, for institutions, corporations and everybody involved in heritage management. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here today and, well, for several reasons. First of all, coming to Galicia is always a good idea. Well, some of my family come from Galicia. I'm very well acquainted with uh, the Rias Baixas, Pontevedra, etc. Also, a couple of months ago, we have actually released the Green Book. So it's quite of a novelty, so it's time to, to make it known because it's a good starting point for what I'm going to share now. This is just the beginning. Also, thanks because on this program, there are some institutions which appear in the book. So I think we have done a good job given that we are quoting the same people. Also, thanks for having invited us to this forum, which is a discussion uh, forum, is a place to exchange experiences, etc. Because a green book is a result of that discussion and also tries to become a meeting point for discussion because it's a, a green book is actually uh, a, a book itself which is already published. There can be a second and a third edition, but there is also a website that I'm going to refer to. And the website 
uh, wants to be like a meeting point or a bi-directional communication channel with uh, cultural heritage managers in Spain. There are many of them and they come from very uh, different sources. We have a very rich cultural heritage in Spain, so everybody's welcome. Apologies because the logo of the ministry is actually old. A couple of days ago, you know that the minister has been uh, changed and there was no time to change the logo. There was no point to do that. And so uh, I was asking people to translate it into Galician. No, actually, it was ready-made because it was translated into uh, the co-official languages of Spain, also in Spanish, English, and French. So on the PPT, there are two QR codes that you can see at the top and at the bottom. It's actually the same QR, and it will lead you to the uh, website of the Green Book. And in the downloads area, you can actually download the book with hyperlinks. Nevertheless, I would like to invite you to browse the website because it's not um, a pure transcription of the book. It's more than that. I said thanks for having invited us in plural because I'm not the only author. I'm one of the co-authors which is the result of a process of collaboration. There are many people involved in the making of the book, which is coordinated by the support unit of the General Directorate of Fine Arts. And two sub-directorates sub have uh, participated in it, the IPC and another one. And well, basically, it's a result of a working group who have been working together for a long period of time. Well, uh, the book, in its uh, physical appearance, begins with a with a dogmatic quote saying that there's no future without memory, and that Spain is abandoned in memory. It is also a cultural superpower, according to the Joseph Me the geopolitician, he said that with um, when you have negotiations with different countries, there is a military side, but there is also a beguiling part, which is a cultural heritage that allows to open many doors. This is um, this was invented by the ancient Greeks when they went to Rome, but actually it, it was quoted or coined by an American um, author who managed to uh, exploit the abundance of uh, the beautiful American landscapes. And these landscapes are part of the American constitution. So uh, the symbolic value of culture is always necessary and present. Culture also has like an ambivalence because on the one hand, it has tangible materials, tangible assets that can be counted, but it also has an intangible value that it's so hard to assess. Um, from that ambivalence, the, the tangible and the intangible side uh, emanates a symbolic value which turns culture into something that is uh, much more than decoration. So in recent years, we have learned that a symbolic value can also generate economic income. And we have learned that uh, for the generation of wealth, you need both values. The symbolic part creates income and the economic part generates what is symbolic because the, the, that cultural heritage can be preserved, but at the same time, the wealth does not change the values of the of the property. That, that would be the sustainable management of cultural heritage. Spain is a superpower, as I said, and its uh, culture generates 3.4% uh, of the GDP, 35 of employment, and like culture would be like our Spanish oil, or rather our best renewable energy source, but it is, uh, it cannot be replaced. 
Uh, so if you lose one piece of heritage, it can never be recovered. You can generate a copy, but it will not be the original one. So in the Green Book, we wanted to begin by uh, explaining what a Green Book is all about. It is not made for reading. I have another one. But it is a, a book for 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 consultation for um, actually underlining uh, areas, pages where you can take notes, etc. Uh, so this is just the first edition of many editions that are there to come in the future. So the Green Book is a co it's, it's a concept, it's a tool for reflection, it's a tool for self-evaluation, for asking questions. We have all been uh, asking questions that are sometimes unanswerable. Joystick Rajizar, who used to be the General Secretary of the International Commission of UNESCO for Conservation and Sustainability, said that sustainability has some issues. As a result of sustainable development, the number of tourists will decrease, then museums would become empty, and then they would no longer be sustainable. But what he meant, basically, is that sustainable development will lead to behavioral changes, and probably there are no answers to those changes. So the purpose of the book is not to, to be a toolkit. It is just a tool to find solutions. It's like a roadmap, just like the website. The goals of the Green Book is to have a joint management model to make progress in the relationship between the, uh, the, the owner of the property and the community that is surrounding that property. And it's also proactive in the sense that for many years we have been reactive. We have been trying to patch up the problems that came up. I think that the concept of the, 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 the debris, the waste, is related to this reactive approach. And I have two pieces of news. The good one is that this is proactive. And the, the bad news is that I'm going to repeat myself because we are all dealing with the same topics. We are all trying to be more efficient um, by planning more about the use of resources. So basically, this page, which is not on the green book, summarizes the process uh, through which it was made, uh, the consultation process, the purpose of the book, which is to be addressed as any kind of manager, such as uh, administrations, companies, uh, curators, and the people who are the gatekeepers, for instance, to parish churches, and they want to keep it sustainable. So there was an open public uh, request to stakeholders, and uh, we announced that there would be a theoretical part and a practical part. The website is like more practical, and it, it gives a list of tips. So we uh, establish a working group, and then after a long process, we uh, came up with a book of 150 pages. This is a summary or a list of the institutions involved in the working group. Uh, there are around a dozen institutions of many different backgrounds. We have National Heritage, which is an institution managing the, the properties of the Crown and then different types of managers. So finally, last September, it was uh, introduced in a meeting together with the Minister of Communication. And on the right-hand side, you can see the presentation to the European Ministers of Culture, where the Caceres Declaration was approved according to the 
Catherine's declaration, one of the sustainable development goals should dedicate one to culture. Culture is present like horizontally in all of them, but there is not a single uh, SDG devoted to culture. So in the Catherine's declaration, we wanted to include one. However, this was a long process. I'm going to try and be as brief as possible because you have already been touching upon this topic, but uh, speaking on behalf of the Ministry of Culture, you need to, in, to go through the whole evolution of the regulations because it's necessary to understand that. This is the ABC Journal from 1972, which refers to the Stockholm Declaration and the concept of the human environment which is a bit outdated now. The Estocolm Declaration, well, actually, I could go um, back in time, but just to begin in 1972, the Stockholm Declaration compared the environment with the Human Rights Declaration. For the first time, it was established that we would not be able to comply with human rights if we disregard the environment. The lady in the center is a minister who actually um, lent her name to the declaration. This was in 1987, and she actually uh, created the concept of sustainability, meaning that what we are using nowadays should not um, make an impact on the future needs. We know that concepts evolve through time, so the, this uh, declaration also inspired the following summits and declarations, just like the Rio summit, the Kyoto and the Johannesburg. Uh, the, 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 the picture on the right is from Rio. The girl is called Huli Suzuki. Uh, well, Suzuki and sustainability do not match, actually, but I, I don't want to show you the video. But if you have not seen it, you, you should uh, uh, Google that girl and listen to her expressions. By the way, uh, now she's a grown-up woman, and she's rather pessimistic about the evolution of sustainability. She's not quite convinced by the changes, but I'm a bit more optimistic because I think that if you're optimistic, you will work better. However, it is hard sometimes. Kyoto, Johannesburg, and then New York, where the SDGs were approved, and the 2030 Agenda. This is about sustainable development related to the environment and ecology. And then we have cultural development. So after the Second World War, Europe was uh, greatly um, affected by the destruction of heritage. Later on, the first picture is the Ashuan campaign in which Spain took part and we managed to actually uh, rescue many monuments which had been uh, affected by the dam in Ashuang. So people became aware of the importance of the heritage and how globalization had an impact on uh, heritage properties. Then in the 60s, when that campaign was over, it, Italy took a step forward. Italy is similar to Spain in that regard. So they established a Franceschini uh, commission uh, talking about uh, cultural goods or cultural assets. And uh, this theory is very important because for the first time, heritage uh, receives a value which goes beyond ownership. It is uh, widely accepted that culture belongs to everyone. The, the second is the Franceschini Commission. The third picture is from 1975, and it's an international UN commission. Spain was there too, but we are like in the last row, but Spain was there too with Felipe González. And they came up with a new concept, 
cultural sustainability. This was fundamental. And then we moved on to Mundia Cool, uh, a great conference, the latest in Mexico, where it was approved that culture should have a more prominent role. And they were asking that it should be part of the SDGs. Sustainability has been one of the strategic axes of Spain as um, turn president of the European Union because we believe, and I think we all agree, that uh, the you know the the, the current uh, progress model is uh, on the decline. I come from Aragon, and you know I love the Pyrenees. But in, in the Pyrenees, the work, the, there are glaciers. You know, people talk about the, the Antarctic and so on and so forth, but there are glaciers in Aragon. And actually, they are disappearing gradually. So climate change is very close to home. Uh, a couple of pictures which refer to a development model that is probably unsustainable. This is the logo of the book. I'm going to talk about publishing issues because I'm actually introducing a book. So let me show you how we came up with this logo. And I'm going to open another book, which is a reading book in this case, which is titled Invisible Cities by Italo Calvino. Um, I, I had it at home and I actually reread it when uh, when we were in lockdown. So Calvino uh, talks about the conversations between Marco Polo and the great Khan, the great Khan from Asia. Of course, they are fictional conversations. And Marco Polo came up with uh, invented cities. And one of them uh, is called Continuous City, and it's called Leonia, quote. The city of Leonia remakes itself every day. Every morning, the citizens wake up in fresh linen, wash themselves with unwrapped soaps. They wear clean garments and they take from the refrigerator unopened cans. The abundance of Leonia is measured by the number of waste that is thrown away every day so as to purchase some new ones. So Leonia Re remakes itself every day. But of course, Leonia is a non-existent city. So the logo is about that, what you pick up, what you process, and what you return. So the cultural heritage is our wealth. There is another sentence by Mala that I like very much, who said that cultural heritage and tradition is about uh, keeping a, keeping the fire alive instead of worshipping ashes. So this is what we do in cultural management. But how do we do it, actually? What is sustainable management? Management is a set of actions, basically, with a particular goal. It's about management, restoration, protection and also assessment, which is something that we tend to forget. We need to assess the progress and the outcomes. It is an integral vision of management as a whole. It's about uh, collecting, uh, registering, disseminating, you know, definitions that we are all familiar with. But in the end, the objective is to preserve heritage and pass it on. There are two diagrams. The first one talks about conservation, the use, and the social participation. And the one on the right talks about related concepts. So this um, intermingling of, of the three of them talks about the environmental, the economic, and the social sustainability. So when you actually look at the book index, you can see that the three are the main topics in the book. Uh, we have not invented anything because these concepts have uh, already been invented. And we know that 
sustainability, according to the regulations, has always been there, but we didn't call it like that. This is an example. This is a screen cap with four pictures of different Galician uh, buildings made of, oh, from Barro, Tui, and Pontevedra. They were taken from the um, uh, Galician plan of traditional architecture, and in that, or rather, national plan of traditional architecture, which already refers to environmental, social, and economic sustainability. So they have always been there, but now we have a more proactive approach to it. In this national plan, uh, it's interesting that they refer to the sustainability of traditional architecture and how this could be uh, translated into contemporary architecture. I think uh, a very disappointing thing is to, to take um, a traditional mason to your own home and they will tell you everything that is going to fail in your home because they have acquired so much experience, so much expertise that it's something that we should keep and retain. So this is what is uh, contained in this National Traditional Architecture Plan. It refers to using zero kilometer materials and process materials, which are more sustainable once they are devolved to the environment. Instead of recycling, we talk about absorption, economic sustainability, which must be feasible. Nobody would build a home that they cannot keep up. And at the same time, durability. Uh, things were built to last. And then social sustainability. When you build with traditional architecture, you, uh, you bring on board the whole knowledge of the community. So it's like, a, it's like a circular economy that makes it sustainable. Nothing is thrown away and everything makes sense. Here is the index. As I was saying, uh, we talk about the tools and the challenges. And the book also refers to problems. Before reaching the challenges, we uh, touch upon the problem, the problems such as climate change, which is number one. It's a reality. I was referring to the glaciers from Aragon. But it's like a um, two-speed reality. At present, heritage is deteriorating. And in the future, the, the, the matter, the status also becomes degraded. The second problem has to do with emergencies. We cannot say there are more emergencies, but it seems that their <laughs> impacts on heritage is bigger. Uh, thirdly, funding or the lack of funding so professionals are not well paid i'm going to uh, uh, to to quote a sentence by churchill and i really like it and he said well churchill was asked during the war is this time to actually allocate the funding from culture to the war so all the money that used to go to culture, why not allocate it to war? So Churchill said, so what are we fighting for? Probably it's an apocryphal quote, but at this point in time, when, I mean, we are not so bad, but we still need to allocate funding correctly. Today, the Spanish uh, official balloting uh, talks about the general budget for 2024. And apart from all the figures there, they uh, refer to like dogmas about culture as an identity sign, culture as an accessible right, the protection of heritage, which seem obvious, but they were not obvious before. The fourth problem is over exploitation. I think that masterism is quite obvious here. Before the pandemic, uh, culture represented 16.9 of the tourism, 
And in 2022, it was around 17%. However, we shouldn't uh, point all the fingers at tourism because the president of the World Tourism Organization said that uh, culture is the author and uh, tourism is a publisher. So it's true that tourism should be sustainable. We, we don't want to make it disappear. Then we've got vandalism, um, which is a serious problem. Vandalism uh, refers to a lack of identity and well, when a person is attacking um, a property, it's because they do not appreciate it. So in the Spanish law from 1985, it says that the heritage has a word that society attributes to it. So only if society is aware of the worth of heritage, it will be valuable. Depopulation, there are around 8,000 municipalities in Spain, and four out of 10 are in the process of depopulation. So this is a big problem that we will have to tackle. Depopulation creates two problems, uh, the abandonment of monuments, which are in ruins, such as churches, and the intangible loss, which is the loss of uh, traditions, knowledge, rituals, and all that. And I think Spain has uh, passed a very interesting law about uh, intangible heritage, and it is well acknowledged by UNESCO. And then inequality. Inequality is an invisible problem sometimes, but uh, we know that accessibility is not profitable. So uh, we have tools for those problems. This is part of the Green Book. There is a toolkit which uh, gives us some ideas to solve problems. And then it refers to challenges, which are uh, classified into three different concepts. For the environment, I cannot read it again, but it refers to tradition. Uh, for instance, uh, esparto, which is a, a type of traditional craft in Spain. And in, in the economic sustainability, it refers to balance, like transhumans, which is a very well-balanced sector, which has to do with, with the migration of cattle. And uh, what we call the scenic villages that try to protect their heritage only for tourism. And then we have social sustainability, which has to do with the, the social cohesion that heritage allows. For instance, the bells is a good expression of social heritage. And it's good to know that uh, bells are being protected. And also from the point of view of inequality, also um, giving more visibility to the role of the women uh, bell ringers and then challenges which are grouped into 12 questions there are many questions in the book but not so many answers so we give them just the tools to find those answers I'm not going to read the 12 <coughs> points but uh, one refers to uh, ecological awareness uh, including prevention not using biocides, using anoxia, which is less pollutant. We talk about the recycling of waste, although it would be better to rethink instead of making more waste. Number four, which is, says what to do in case of an emergency, because in my unit, uh, we are also part of a national emergency plan. So we we think about uh, emergency action plans, assessing risks, monitoring risks. Then number five has to do with giving new uses to cultural heritage, such as uh, the burden capacity, the occupancy, etc. These are 
six more challenges up to 12. Number seven, which has to do with the professionalism in the sector. We don't want precarious type of labor, which is not positive for people or for the heritage. So we should appreciate heritage, but also those who are responsible for preserving it. And well, number 10, which talks about how to involve the civil society. And I would say that there are more and more projects which stem from the grassroots. <coughs> Another diagram that you can find in the book, in this case about conservation. And the first question is, is the proposed action really necessary? Because sometimes people rush to action and in the end there's no need. Uh, more questions about planning. When we are managing a project, we need to assess very well the burden associated to that. The website also has a resources page. In this case, uh, it, this one is about funding, which is very interesting for all of you. Uh, so you have a list of grants that you can apply for. And I would invite managers to, to, to go into that funding site. And then in the last few minutes, I'm going to, uh, to show you the good practices included in the Green Book. There are many examples throughout the book, but the website actually is like a showcase of good practices and explaining what territory means in Spain. This is just a, a, a first uh, <coughs> page of examples. So when you click into that site, you will see files. So on the left, you will see a list of fields explaining the good practice and also highlighting the tools and challenges associated with it. So it's not just by highlighting uh, individual good practices. It's uh, about highlighting the strengths of each good practice. The idea is that people can uh, browse those good practices and get ideas for maybe solving other issues. And I'm going to show you a few of these. Maybe you can have some good ideas from those examples. This is uh, the Cadiz Ironsmith foundry, uh, which is an industrial foundry. Uh, that was uh, abandoned because of new industrial processes. And this is a result of uh, a project made by the local community with the purpose of turning the uh, Cadiz Foundry uh, in something that is open to the general public, organizing workshops, etc. So it attracted the interest of the administrations, uh, labeling, labeling it as BIC, and cultural interests good. So in Cadiz, uh, they talk about tradition, new uses, cultural tourism, demographics. And this is another example, a very good project from Taula del Senia, uh, comprising 20 municipalities uh, between three regions, uh, which uh, contain 5,000 thousands of years old olive trees. So how are they managing this, uh, this project? It is a commonwealth of councils and the management is shared 50-50% with the uh, corporations. So people will pay visits to the olive tree fields and at the same time they, they are making oil. At the same time they have open air museums and routes so that people can have a good vision of cultural heritage. And now to, to, to change the focus, there are big monuments such as the Seville Cathedral. Since the year 2000, they have a preventive conservation plan. So step by step, they try to preserve the cathedral, like cleaning the facade, cleaning the stained glass windows one by one, uh, replacing the gargoyles, the pinnacles, etc. So it's, this is good for planning, but it's good 
in the sense of uh, awareness raising, because it's a gradual process of uh, restoration that is somehow shared with, uh, with the professionals. It's about maintaining good quality jobs for the restoration professionals. And it, it is also surveilled by the IPC. This is something called anti-convocatoria, the anti-call. It's a group of people, which is the REAC, which is something like the Spanish network of community agents. They are uh, sponsored by a trust and they have a call <coughs> so that groups can apply for that call without, uh, without getting immersed in the red tape. So uh, they give you a good idea and then you have to develop that idea with your working group. So they all develop the project together. They have been working for a couple of years and it's, uh, it is working out. There are around 300 different associations or groups. The next example, maybe it's a bit painful because it's St. George of Estella. This was a very, very controversial uh, action because the parish priest allowed uh, a small workshop to restore the, the sculpture. You can see how it evolved from the top to the bottom. Uh, the, the last one on the right hand side corner is a final appearance. So this is an example of good practices by the authorities because at first the parish priest made the wrong decision and then there was a public action in order to, uh, to, to revert the, the sculpture of St. George, mm, well, 65 actually of the original sculpture, sculpture was uh, returned to, re, to its original appearance. This is Lorca in Murcia, which suffered a couple of earthquakes in 2011. And 20 days later, a decree was passed in order to recover the cultural heritage in Lorca. In this case, this is a, a good practice of collaboration between the administrations. 98% of the funds have already been implemented. And this has been very useful in, in order to assess the usefulness of the funding. And this also gave rise to a publication about this good practice. Another example of emergencies. This is a project by the community of Madrid. Understanding how difficult it is to, to organize safeguards in all of the cultural interest properties in Madrid, they have made a list of minimum criteria to comply with, such as um, emergency, escape routes, uh, fire extinguishers, etc. So they have a multidisciplinary team of experts and following some guidelines they can uh, give useful tips to first responders. So in, in the final remarks, I'm going to discuss what public museums do, uh, especially those belonging to the Ministry of Culture. This is an exhibition that opened last Monday in the uh, Decorative Arts Museum, trying to reuse the showcases, the showcases from the right, were turned into the other, the other way around. The, 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 sh the shelves on the wall were turned into tables. On the left, you can see an exhibition of the model man, which is you know, the Kyber man or, you know, these this little toys, which were turned into um, cartographic works of art. <coughs> And on the top right-hand side, you can see the Valladolid Museum with an exhibition about Ricardo de Orueta. And the whole furniture was recycled. And in the bottom right, you see a project by the Thyssen Museum, which is called Espigar. Um, so the four, they have not reached the zero waste, but 
Those objects that cannot be recycled are sent to schools, and schools will <coughs> use them to, to make projects or different types of art. The picture is taken in Madrid. And then other additional measures, which are more focused to internal work, such as the tele messages, uh, upcycling furniture, using this map for the enlargement of the Soroya Museum, taking into account accessibility. At the top, you have a dissemination campaign related to the America's Museum. Uh, highlighting the sustainability of traditional cultures. And in the bottom right, you can see an example of collaboration where they have included people uh, and privileged people. Uh, I would like you to contribute to the website in this section called Participa, Take Part, where you can leave your comments or criticism so that it belongs to all of us. And this is a, a self-assessment tool, inviting managers to ask questions. And, you know, there are still many doubts uh, <coughs> regarding all of the points included in the Green Book. So just to finish, uh, I have dedicated plenty of time to communication. And communication was seen as a burden. Nobody wants to do communication in a museum. So I think that the least sustainable thing is having a visitor who leaves the museum without having understood anything. Because all the resources, all the CO2 emissions, if a visitor doesn't learn anything from the museum, everything has been wasted. So I want you to also focus on communication and good practices in order to make our cultural heritage more sustainable. So thank you very much. Now we can open the floor to discussion. OK, so we're going to have some time for discussion, Q&A, our intention. Um, is uh, to, when we chose this topic, to raise awareness. We have a group of students here today from the Pontevedra School, from other, uh, or from the Galician School, and from other uh, schools from the rest of Spain. And, well, you're young and you have known these from situation from the beginning, but uh, there are many professionals, uh, museum practitioners, who have had to uh, go through many different stages and changes in terms of our professional life. And it is therefore important uh, for us to be flexible, uh, for us to be uh, optimistic uh, in the face of this um, situation, it is true that um, more often than not we see good intentions and not so good results. But I think that, uh, well, here today with us are five uh, professionals, five practitioners from uh, four different uh, very important institutions, um, varied institutions, or I mean, different institutions with different perspectives. And here today, you have the opportunity to, to ask questions to them or to bring um, ideas or comments to the table uh, in, and engage in that uh, debate. Hello. I would like to ask a question to Kim on the studies that she's been conducting in key culture on materials uh, of uh, for packaging, packaging materials. I've seen that uh, these studies uh, focus on transport materials mainly. So I would like to know whether you do uh, studies on materials also for for a permanent uh, storing. 
And within the framework of uh, permanent storing, I'd like to also ask you whether you introduce some type of bias in terms of the type of materials. I am interested in the issue of archaeological materials, which uh, are more uh, delicate uh, than for other uh, artworks and that need uh, specific uh, material uh, packaging and specific types of packaging. And often we deal with untreated materials that are more prone uh, to degradation. So I would like to know whether you conduct any type of uh, biased base uh, studies or whether you know about other institutions or organizations or companies or publications that deal with this issue. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, I want to preface that with, you know, I, I am a contemporary art conservator and my other work, I work very closely with Gallery Climate Coalition as well for commercial galleries and um, again mostly contemporary art and this is where my focus is. Um, I'm also not conducting these studies myself necessarily but working with other conservators. I mean National Trust is, is, is also historic paintings, it's not archaeological um, um, artifacts necessarily. Um, uh, I'm sure that there are, again, I'm, I'm more focused in contemporary, modern, and, and commercial transport specifically because uh, I feel like that has a larger impact as well um, in general. I feel like there's more artworks being transported for art fairs and for collectors, and it's, there's, you know, I, I think more disposable um, packaging used. It's one-way shipping and packaging. Um, so that's kind of where my focus has been, just because it's my background, and again, um, you know, the people that I'm that I'm working with, uh, in that in that sense, uh, storage materials. I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, it's we, we. I feel like there's very strict standards in conservation for storage materials, um, and in that sense, I would, you know, it comes comes down to just reusing. Um, Materials. Uh, I know that Key Culture is recently um, working with Gopion, who makes vitrines. Uh, they're located in Italy, in Milan, uh, and we will be working with them in developing sustainable production and shipping of their vitrines that are also then used for archaeological um, artifacts and objects as well. Uh, so it's yes, yeah, so I would say it's, it's more heavily biased towards towards more contemporary modern, just because of of who I am and what I you know where my work and where, where my experience is in modern materials and contemporary art. Um, but there certainly are people looking into this, uh, and I yeah thank you for bringing that up because I also hope in the key book um, it's mindful not to be too. Uh, biased in one sort of one one field of cultural heritage, I, it needs to address um, obviously uh, you know other other specializations in in conservation as well. So thank you for for bringing that up. Well, not really. I mean, each institution has its own policy, but we think that the most appropriate thing to do is to look at the uh, work of art and analyze it and the route also, the, insti the receiving institution. And I can tell you that most uh, times we do this uh, virtually, remotely, but not always. Recently, we had some issue that we were concerned about and we sent a physical courier but uh, as much as possible we'll try to make this uh, virtually yes it is also true that often uh, i mean uh, museums since they have uh, 
restoration and conservation departments, and we know that this, uh, uh, restorers are going to be receiving and checking things. I mean, it is a, it's very easy for us to actually interact and, and communicate among us and to have uh, uh, photos uh, sent and this kind of thing. And, and well, this enables us to do things uh, virtually or remotely. I have mentioned uh, telecourier. This is a practice that is intensified after COVID, but this uh, it was just accelerated by COVID, but it was something that was going to uh, arrive uh, sooner or later. At the end of the day, this concept is based on a need that you have that you have when there is a cooperation between two museums, and this is a trust. I, at the end of the day, a telecourier uh, does, uh, I mean, a sort of uh, is a form uh, that shows uh, a trust uh, behind that uh, cooperation. So I would like to highlight the technical work that the receiving museum needs to uh, uh, make uh, uh, when it's receiving this type of uh, 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 shipment. So at the end of the day, uh, this is showing a good relationship, a trust-based uh, relationship and, uh, well, the positive side of this in terms of uh, the positive conservation of an asset. Hello. Uh, the presentations have been great for uh, me, terrific, as uh, you would say in English, all of them. And I would like to touch upon some uh, sensitive uh, topics, just to try and uh, generate some discussion, and to do also some comments on, well, intentions, and the need to reflect on the things that we have done uh, wrong in the past. And there was something that I found interesting, uh, the fact that some words have not been brought to the table, the Calvino's Invisible City is about capitalism. Capitalism is based on producing uh, garbage and to sell it uh, for the highest possible price and then that's it. Uh, consumption is the basis of capitalism. But capitalism has hardly been mentioned. And also the word petroleum, oil, uh, hasn't been mentioned that much, which is another of the pillars of the problem, we could say, the roots of the problem. So I would like to uh, have some reflection on uh, the amount to which or the extent to which uh, uh, mistakes that have been made in the past at the professional level, for example, professions, conservation, uh, conservation, uh, uh, preservation, uh, restoration. I mean, I mean, I work, I come from the archaeological uh, um, context and background, and archaeologists have done things, have done thing, uh, have done things unsustainably. And I'm thinking of engineering, art itself. So it would be good to reflect on the mistakes that we've made in the past, and this would lead us to think on reflect on things uh, such as w would we uh, build a. a a building like this museum or like the uh, Guggenheim Museum. The greenwashing concept is something I don't really like, but uh, uh, well, the solutions that we uh, bring uh, might be uh, uh, insufficient for the size of the problem. Maybe there, to reflect on what we have done wrong in the past, the mistakes that we've made in the past would be could be helpful in this uh, regard. Well, I'm going to tell you about my point of view. Maybe the director of the museum might say something different. And uh, my opinion, therefore, is that we need to strike a balance. For example, in the case of Bilbao, which is a heavy industry city, uh, uh, I mean, with thousands of industry workers, this disappeared. At the 90s crisis, these factories stopped existing. And that people need to, uh, those people need to work. So 
uh, work arts are very works of art are very important. So politicians back then uh, decided to turn that grey industrial city that I liked, but that was not was not attractive for tourists. So they decided to turn it into uh, something different, uh, and they sort of uh, thought of the Guggenheim uh, museums. Uh, which has uh, worked well in uh, Bilbao. I mean, it has generated wealth and it has attracted uh, tourists. Uh, and this uh, has implications for the hospitality sector and for many other sectors. So we need to be reasonable. We need to try and strike a balance between uh, you know fulfilling uh, human rights such as the right to work and then also to reach sustainability and to try to strike a balance between both things in spite of the fact that more often than not the definition of one of them might lead us to uh, uh, reflect on things so uh, this might be uh, contrary to the structure itself of things so what i think is that we need to strike some sort of balance some type of balance it's an ethical question that you're raising here simply put can we have infinite growth on a finite planet and we can't capitalism is based on that so we need a system, systemic change and capitalism will not change itself. It will always try and consume the new uh, proposals. And how that affects museums, of course, is very interesting and, and very demanding. And I think um, we should all be active, uh, as I said earlier on a couple of times, there's a process going on in ICOM now about the code of ethics. The third uh, consultation period ends at the end of November, so you all still have a chance to uh, say something about it if you feel it's necessary. Um, a couple of things that connect what you're saying with things that were raised a bit earlier. Um, there was much talk about plastic and how I, I worked in an art museum in Oslo um, on the um, not on the cons art, conservators' uh, side, but on the on the uh, uh, the people who um, packed things and, and sent things. and uh, So the amount of plastic was enormous, as was pointed out earlier on. And, and we have accepted that. We've built a whole system on that. So if we hop from there to this talk about the increase about data as well, how we're all um, finding solutions after COVID or during COVID to increase the digital museum. These two things, we're, we're, we're in the danger of locking ourselves into that too, into the, into the digital world and consuming so much energy. And as you say, that's, that's the problem here. The energy, at the moment, we're, we're still using 82% fossil fuel to create energy. All the, all the uh, sun panels and the windmills that are being produced all over the world haven't touched it. Because the problem here again is capitalism. It increases, it takes the new stuff and brings it in. So we don't. You don't reduce things, there's no degrowth here. There's just a matter of increased growth, increased growth. So we have a, an ethical question that museums fundamentally should ask the question. I mean, are we, are we, are, are we prepared to carry on in the system, as I said earlier on? Uh, is it any possible to go way into the future, uh, business as usual? And of course, I totally agree with uh, what was said here about changing um, an environment uh, where it's necessary and jobs and how this is good, has to be woven into each other but it's a very difficult problem and uh, um, I'm a grandfather and uh, I have some grandchildren and I really am very concerned about um, what happens at the end of the, this century when they're my age and all the young people here I would hope uh, also wondering what um, the museum institution ethically will do to answer these questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> right. Yeah, there we go. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm very happy to hear the, the term degrowth being uh, brought into the conversation um, because it is a topic that I, I 
think is very important to touch upon, and thank you for your question as well. Uh, and this is maybe, uh, we can talk about this afterwards, but the principles of degrowth where it's slowing down, it's you know, shipping, because you know, I've been so hyper-focused on materials and I try to find, you know, I've been trying to find these like solutions that as I was saying, um, the issues are more systemic. Uh, I've, I've been calling these band-aid solutions, right? Like it's important for us to understand the implications of the materials that we're using, but is this a band-aid solution to a larger problem? Um, and how do we address this problem? Uh, is it potentially through then degrowth? So this means instead of switching a packaging material uh, for a crate, maybe we even question the, the necessity to be shipping these artworks and artifacts in the first place. Um, less exhibitions per year, you know, where if, if a museum has maybe six exhibitions per year, maybe reduce that to, to two or three and have them um, up longer, uh, which then, you know, then raises the question again as far as like financial sustainability and is this a viable solution? And I'm really happy, I would love to actually hear your response to this because uh, you know, we obviously, I feel like any action we make is going to have, going to have some sort of like reverberation in another, in another way. And um, it's difficult to, to think about these things again holistically and, um, you know, not potentially damage the economic viability of a cultural institution because we're, there's, there's, there's fewer exhibitions or not supporting artists as much because there's fewer exhibitions. Um, so I, yeah, I would like to, to Open that up. You can. <laughs> Thank you. Gracias. I hear him from a um, journalist. One of them is uh, Montserrat Roch, who says that uh, culture is the most revolutionary option in the long term. And also, there is a Canadian uh, journalist, who is Carl Honore, who says that the uh, revolution will be slow and it won't happen at all. Um, so, activists say, think global, act local. Uh, so, this is some sort of a parallel pathway. On the one hand, we've got big international bodies with the SDGs, uh, with uh, something that sounds very lofty, and are positive values that we sort of take for granted. But there were uh, not so far away times where uh, values were much more negative. And even today, we can. Uh, well, hear people talk about very negative values and promote these values. And the uh, other direction is the uh, role of small managers. More often than we're not aware of the power of museums, which was the uh, motto of the previous edition of this Congress, the power of, con uh, of uh, museums. Museums are generators of reputation to a great extent. Companies want to announce themselves at a museum. The small steps that a museum can take leave a footprint. And it's been interesting to hear uh, the representatives of the Guggenheim Museum talk about their strategic plan and the results of their plan and how this translates into other uh, uh, actors. And in the case of the Spanish Ministry for Culture, the fact that they are attaching value to the reuse of packaging in their contracts and the fact that uh, the uh, hiring of uh, vulnerable um, uh, staff or vulnerable people for their staff, I mean, who, who are people who are at risk of being excluded, this is relevant and uh, important. Uh, so, fortunately, uh, of course, we've got a number of uh, regulations and rules, but there is a way to have an influence on these things. I think that big problems need to be tackled gradually by fragmenting them, them from by breaking them down, breaking them down into smaller departments. So. Uh, having the opportunity to tackle sustainability from uh, museums as credible institutions is the key uh, at the end of the day, I think. Uh, at the end of the day, we're not going to be the ones who are making the decisions. So whether another Guggenheim needs to be built or another type of museum, because often when these big museums are built, uh, the technical opinion is not taken into consideration, then we've got this uh, huge uh, unsustainable buildings. Um, so 
actions that are reasonable actions that are being applied in museums, such as reusing shop, uh, showcases, uh, because there is not no money for new ones. So uh, many museums have been reusing uh, showcases, and at the end of the day, we realize that we're contributing to a sustainable development. So there are implications of this uh, sustainable development, uh, and also the work with local communities and groups that are, are of people who are at the risk of being excluded, try and give visibility to women. Uh, we, I mean, account for 50% um, of the population, and the construction of history in the 19th century left us aside, I mean, uh, women, us women. And the, 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 we're talking about projects that are in line with the SDGs that have been for years now, and many museums at the international level and at the national level are uh, taking this into consideration. So gradually, by taking these small steps, uh, we managed to actually uh, do things and share our experience with other colleagues, and that is a way to create synergies and uh, to make these type of activities uh, possible in other institutions. And also, in terms of the moral uh, uh, side of uh, sustainable development at museums, as uh, it's been said, we have the, uh, this is the third stage of the consultation of the um, the ontological code. Uh, this dates back to 1986. The last revision was made in 2004. And after the establishment of a new definition of museums, well, there is a, an open consultation to the members of ICOM regarding uh, whether it, this should be uh, modified or not. So we are at a, a, a crucial uh, stage with the opportunity for many members to actually take part in this consultation process on a number of issues such as artificial intelligence or sustainability, which are issues that have been brought to the table. Uh, it is time to uh, uh, debate on this and to regulate on this within the framework of the organization. I represent a local museum, the Menorca Museum, a very small museum, and many of the principles that have been mentioned and the concepts that have been mentioned were used in sustainability. This is in our essence because for us, a showcase, uh, well, we use it 40 times at this, and this. Uh, reminds me of our grandmothers and uh, the concept of throwing things away was not in the equation. Everything was reused. So this is something that maybe the big museums or this uh, big uh, exhibition uh, capitalist mentality uh, is something that needs to be taken into consideration. In many museums, small museums like ours, this uh, is not so. I mean, we haven't been able to grow much ever so we all have always have had in mind this concept of degrowth really so this is something that is a part of our essence and this is something that we've been implementing from the economical point of view but also the concept of sustainability has been now being brought to the table well this is something that i've been uh, working on together with our conservation colleagues so we wouldn't uh, throw away a piece of plastic because we use it many times and for example if we talk about temporary exhibitions we have started using other types of materials such as paper cardboard textile materials materials, uh, wood, that are easier to reduce. So I just wanted to reflect on the fact that, uh, well, mm, financial distance between uh, small museums and big mm, museums might mean that uh, maybe smaller museums are more sustainable because of our economical limitations. Since we had never had big budgets, we uh, have embraced this concept of sustainability and recycling uh, for longer. And thank you very much for your presentations and contributions.
One of the museums, great museums, that has addressed sustainability the most is the Tate Modern in London. They have this, they've worked a whole system through the, all their departments. Every, every department has to have a sustainability representative. Uh, so they've been, I mean, when um, uh, at these big exhibitions, they have sustainable food, you know, they, and it's made locally. It's, uh, so they, somebody was earlier on speaking to me about it's a, what we need is an attitude change. What you've just said about your grandmother is, is, is exactly the sort of thing that we need to be changing to. We need to be thinking this, uh, we have to save everything. You know, it's recircling, we were talking about the circular economy earlier on. All these things are uh, woven together into, into the challenges that, uh, that we must meet and if we're going to succeed. Measuring the carbon footprint, maybe a relevant thing to take into consideration would be to uh, think about what is the extent to which a greater distribution in terms of uh, cultural access, uh, a greater uh, geographical distribution in connection with the role of peripheral or small, smaller museums. Uh, I mean, does this have a positive impact in terms that, uh, in the sense that uh, um, big museums have generated a moment when uh, access in culture was something that was not uh, uh, provided for for everybody, and they have been very centralised. They've been uh, located. They are located in big cities, and this means that uh, tourists have to um, travel to. Uh, places where there are iconic uh, works of art, like, uh, for example, going to Madrid to visit the museums and the musicals, or going to uh, uh, Paris to visit the Louvre, or going to London, uh, London to, to visit the British Museum, for example. When maybe it would be much more interesting to give uh, the population the possibility, the opportunity to uh, enjoy culture in a more low, at a more local level. So museums such as these, uh, some of them represented here today, uh, contribute or to a certain extent or to reduce that uh, carbon footprint. I mean, to which extent do these museums contribute in terms of reducing uh, their carbon footprint? Because you might go to a, a, a village that is uh, 30 or 40 um, kilometers away for an exhibition, instead of going to Madrid, you are reducing carbon footprint. And if many people do this, the reduction of the carbon footprint is uh, uh, very relevant. So maybe we should um, take this into consideration. And just to give an example, maybe the carbon footprint of the Mona Lisa if uh, it is uh, borrowed by the Pontevedra Museum will be uh, smaller than that of uh, 10,000 people from Pontevedra who might go to Ponte to Paris for a decade, during a decade, over a decade, over 10 years. So the question behind this might be the following. So do you take into consideration the possibility to include this uh, type of uh, measurements? Well, in principle, we don't. We measure our own, and this is based on real data. I agree with you that, uh, well, we've got this uh, uh, idea of going to Paris, eating a baguette and uh, going to see the Mona Lisa. So yes, we could uh, reduce that uh, carbon footprint. Uh, but I'm going to tell you about our experience. We normally get people from other countries, but after COVID, uh, during COVID, the people from Bilbao and from the province started visiting our museum. And often, many of these people have been to Paris and seen the Mona Lisa, but have not been to the um, Guggenheim Museum. So it is true that mm, there are uh, relevant implications 
this regard. And I think that, uh, well, this is a very interesting thing to take into consideration. I mean, people came to uh, the Guggenheim Museum, people from Bilbao, only when uh, the pandemic started and they couldn't actually travel to other countries to visit other museums. So this is a question for Kim. Uh, in connection with the study that has been conducted to stop using um, climate uh, control systems, uh, in one of the situations there's been a considerable reduction, a sizable reduction of the energy uh, consumption. But I would like to ask you: Do you know what is the type of uh, material of the pieces? And uh, I ask a study being conducted in connection with this um, uh, process. I'm sorry, but they were. The sound was not good enough. Okay, I, I, I think I think so. I think I, I think I got most of it. Um, you were asking about the materials that were that were the focus of this of the climate control study. I wasn't involved with that stu that study. I mean. Um, Again, I'm, you know, I'm here representing key culture. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm focusing on, on other aspects of sustainability, um, and again, like working a lot with GCC on various projects at the moment. So I can't really speak to that. But what I just, I would assume, um, um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's the same as like the, the Bezo Green Protocols that are focusing on organic material. Uh, so it's essentially like, as I was speaking before with the National Trust of separating a collection into susceptible and non-susceptible, um, I'm, I'm assuming that they're approaching it in a very similar way, where the you know organic um, materials uh, and artworks and artifacts that are comprised of organic materials have, have require special conditions, right? We need to monitor the RH, we need to make sure that the temperature is is in check and not fluctuating, um, and having having those, you know, either in microclimates, um, or there's also, you know, the, the the strategy of having, you know, particular rooms of a museum that are climatized and the rest not, or again using the the microclimates in vitrines, uh, and then sort of leaving the the rest of the um, collection to ambient conditions. Uh, I think that's that's more or less the strategy. If that, did, I, did I answer your question, or did I talk about something completely different? <laughs> did I, you can, do you want to clarify? clarify? You can. We have conducted an assessment of those assets or property uh, and it, its behavior. I guess this has been done with a, an organic material, I mean, not using a climatization system. So what, what tools were used or how they were assessed is, sorry. Yes, uh, I mean, whether the behavior of these materials has been assessed. The behavior of the materials has been assessed. Um, they, uh, I mean, I think that is a part, I know that Key Culture also was partnering with um, Conserve. Uh, and also Artichek, uh, who does the digital couriers, but then also to monitor um, the uh, behavior of the materials over time and to prove that, you know, again, certain materials in ambient climate aren't going to be affected drastically. Uh, so there, there is a methodology in place for monitoring those materials. Um, I'm sorry, I do not have the, the details of that. <laughs> um, but if you, if, yeah, you can also write um, write me if you have my email from before, and I can can dig into that for you and, and see where they where they're at. And that uh, it's a very new again, it's a very new pilot, and um, yeah, I'm not I'm not personally in, involved in it, so uh, I only know the the bare the bare bones of of what's going on. property, but uh, we need to ask ourselves how many uh, museums have systems that can actually fulfill the standards and meet the standards and what happens with the rest of the heritage? Is it been maintained or is it uh, stable? 
we have implemented very rigid standards and the recommendations that uh, they well have been uh, implemented might be a little bit less rigid in these terms because many institutions cannot really uh, meet these requirements. Uh, how many uh, Latin American institutions, for example, can actually meet these standards? How many African or Asian institutions can actually meet these uh, requirements? And how many Spanish institutions, even I work as a, a conservator in a museum where not all the uh, rooms are uh, climatized and we have Phoenician uh, uh, coffins and uh, Phoenician jewels and also Thurbaran paintings but they are maintained in uh, an unstable ambient that do not m maybe does not meet the the standards but that is uh, well uh, good enough so just like this is applicable also to church uh, uh, heritage that is not being, um, uh, I mean, properly conserved in this regard. So at the end of the day, we have a stable condition in this regard, and this is what uh, uh, brings uh, a, a, a well favorable uh, 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 parameter in this regard. Okay, uh, nine percent of the. Uh, plastic has been uh, recycled according to key culture. So, uh, well, I'm not going to say anything new. It is clear that at least in Spain, uh, uh, recycling companies have a good business. So they are dealing with a great business because we sort of separate for them. So we give them the raw materials. Is, uh, the raw materials is free for them. Uh, it is free for them and that they sell it back to you. So this is good business for them. Um, so uh, this is uh, embedded in the mind of citizens, the fact that uh, responsibility in terms of climate change and climate degradation is our own responsibility when we don't have the uh, financial resources to tackle this issue, uh, to really tackle this issue. So could we have a solution in? Or is it possible that we could start recycling, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, companies, recycling uh, companies, if we stopped uh, uh, recycling and we stopped separating materials and giving them this for free, to put it like that. Well, I would like to um, question whether your plastics are in fact being recycled because we also sort our plastics in, in Germany. Um, however, only a small percentage of those are actually getting recycled. So we think things are being recycled, but I mean, I, again, I, I would I really encourage you to look into this and to ask questions, because I, for so many years, thought that everything that I was sorting into recycling was being recycled, and, and it's, it's not. It's not. It's mostly it's a small percentage recycled. I think in Germany, and Germany is known for also having high recycling rates. I think um, in Berlin, with our local waste management, it was 30% of all the plastics that are sorted, that we sort out, and then the rest are burned for energy recovery, it's called. So there's energy that's generated from that, and that's also business, right? That's also, um, it's also money being, being generated. Um, the issue with, with the plastic industry is that there's a finite, the, we use mechanical recycling right now, and with mechanical recycling, there's only so many times a plastic can be recycled because the polymer chains get shorter every time, and then the plastic loses its, its physical properties. So virgin plastic has to be added every single time there's a recycling um, cycle. And uh, there's many people, for example, I'm working I'm working in an art residency right now with Jan Bolin, who's the um, artist, um, artistic director of Ar uh, Luma Arlo in, in France. And he, his solution, he wants to burn all plastics in the world and just like start anew using biomaterials. And uh, he feels like the recycling industry is reinforcing our dependency on uh, fossil fuel industry, right? It's it's um, it's it's they they they're necessary for one another. So even recycling, unless we switch to a chemical recycling process, which is very expensive and we don't use that yet, uh, there's still going to be a tie-in from the fossil fuel industry, uh, and they're still going to be making money off of this. So that's that's a that's a counter um, uh, arg argument to to plastic recycling. And yeah. A few layers of, of counter arguments to that. Ready? 
talks, they have been very interesting. And apart from the material part of the recycling or use of recycled materials, which are more environmentally friendly, I'd like to ask about the digital revolution that museums have come on board and which has uh, taken up speed after the pandemic. Are we capable of um, auditing the emissions generated by the use and management of data servers where we are actually uh, storing all, all that digital content? So, you know, the images, for instance, have a very high resolution and they are, they are richer in data content. So is that a good um, way to, to proceed or should we also uh, tackle this problem of the, the burden of digital content? And what is the point of view of institutions about the digital footprint? Thank you. Well, in our case, when there is a virtual mail, uh, everything is uh, streamed. In, in the case of a file, for instance, we would only uh, use it, we would only use an attachment for the um, maintenance report of a construction work, for instance. I don't know, actually, I'm not familiar with the digital burden that I was talking about in my presentation, but I think it's probably uh, lower than sending emails when there is no need to do that. I uh, uh, worked in this small museum in, on this island in northern Norway um, for 25 years. And um, in that time, we went from storing copies of every letter that came into the museum and writing a, in a book and storing them in files and putting them on shelves behind us. And suddenly this new world opened that we didn't have to do that anymore. There's an archive law in Norway which says actually that official uh, organizations have to keep copies of everything. Um, I think probably five or six times in the last 10 years this question has been brought up and people in, in the government have said, yes, we're going to have to do something. We have to make a plan. But on the floor in the museum, people, they don't. I mean, they all just have large archives on their machines or on the cloud. Or, so, so this is a, a really very, very uh, important, another very, very important sustainable question that you've um, brought up and it needs to be uh, something perhaps ICOM should take up as well because after the after the, uh, um, the pandemic they, they did a, um, a footprint on the secretariat in ICOM and they found that 90% I think or 89% of the carbon footprint was related to flying museum people flying around the world to meet and so there was a question okay well we should have to concentrate now on on meeting digitally. And uh, so later on this afternoon, I'll be involved in a digital conversation with people from five continents. So this is, this is really, it's just a little, as I was saying earlier on, it's a bit like plastic, you know, that everybody, plastic is wonderful, you know. I can remember my mother having Tupperware things and thinking, but gosh, we can keep things clean and, and, and uh, store things. And, and then we were locked in into using plastic. And now we're getting locked into using the digital sphere uh, and I'm not saying this in the bad, I mean, it's a fantastic thing, of course, but we need to be aware of what we're doing, that's the point. And again, this is where museums where their ethical foundation should be leading in these sort of discussions. So I think it's very important that you take that question and, uh, and discuss it amongst your colleagues and fellow students. Yeah, um, I also wanted to respond uh, 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 it's a very interesting question, and I don't think we really have baselines yet for comparison. Um, however, I want to tell a story. I, I have a friend, my a former classmate of mine, who's the film and photo conservator at the National Museum in Iceland. And I was just having dinner with him a couple weeks ago, and he was telling me that they have six million archived photos in Iceland, 
And they're mostly from family, you know, it's, it's basically people don't know how to take care of their, their family photos and, and sort of dump them off at the museum. So I'm calling this the largest family photo album in the world. It's six, six million photos. And um, he, he told me this and then, and then instantly regretted it because <laughs> he knows I'm going to talk about it. Um, but they keep all of those six million photos in cold storage and all of these photos are treated with argon gas in addition. Uh, and so the question of whether or not to digitize those six million photos, what the carbon, what the, the energy um, consumption for that would be over, I don't know how many, you know, over a hundred years versus the cold storage. I, you know, I, I don't have those numbers. Um, there is issues as well in digitizing, as we may, may or may not know. Um, I, I also have studied time-based media conservation of, like, of migrating digital um, uh, artworks and, and copies. There's issues as, we, you know, as, as certain technologies become obsolete and digital formats become obsolete of migrating everything and things get lost, th files get corrupted. Uh, and so it's not, a sure, it's not a certain way to archive cultural heritage, for, uh, it, I, I feel very skeptical about uh, digitizing for the long term. Um, however, also keeping six million family photos in cold storage is, is also not the solution. Um, and then, you know, the discussion we were having earlier about, you know, potential like degrowth um, and reusing, but then there's also the uh, issue of, of, of deaccessioning works. You know, do the collections need to be as Large and I, you know, when I talk about this Iceland uh, case study or these, this example, I, I, you know, I'm always like, how, you know, how many photos of Grandpa next to his his ponies on the farm do they do we need? You know, do we need all of all 20 of them, or you know, just a cross section, <laughs> or <laughs> or one or two? Um, but then it's also then the, the, this weird ethical sticky situation of who decides what we're keeping and who decides what's relevant, and so these are still. Um, issues that you know we're discussing and that I'm also very in invested in because I am working on another um, in this artist residency uh, the art uh, cons is for uh, essentially an artwork produced by a collective in Canada and they're challenging the um, acquisition protocols for artworks where the artist determines the lifespan of the artwork so an artist can say, I don't want my artwork to be in cold storage. I don't want my artwork to receive conservation treatments. I want my artwork to live and die and have, uh, have, a, have a, a lifespan. Um, and so we're working on this. It's more of a theoretical project, but we're working on that um, to hopefully, yeah, introduce into, into policy in, in museums as well and giving artists, again, um, if they... And then it's the question of who decides, right? Who decides? But uh, you know, if the artist wants, as a part of the concept of their artwork, that in, that the materials perform by aging or you know, running risk of, and oftentimes, I mean, unless it's a plastic, uh, a synthetic material, organic material, like things, things are fine. Um, so yeah, these are these are, you know, a lot of the thoughts I've been having recently. Uh, it's like the deaccessioning and um, and yeah, shortening the lifespan of of artworks, not artifacts, not historical artifacts, but artworks themselves. One of the nice things about being on a conversation like this is that you have tangents. So, what I was thinking about uh, under the last um, um, leg here was that um, something else that museums really have to take into account is time. I mentioned earlier on about the Great Acceleration, uh, which is 75 years. Uh, the Anthropocene now would probably be dated to have begun uh, in, in uh, 1951. Uh, I can remember the first time somebody told me that you could take a photograph on a mobile telephone. I mean, that was like in, uh, it was in, in Berlin uh, 24, 25 years ago, I think. Uh, and so, we're so focused on what we're living in, this time that we're living in, and this enormous growth that we've been part of, that we maybe forget that time goes back many, 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 many thousands of years, and will of course go in the other direction too. And, and th these sorts of uh, um, ideas and thoughts that, uh, that have been presented here have to be put into this 
concept of geological time. I mean, it's very important that uh, one places value on things in terms of time, I think. And uh, uh, it's, um, it's something, again, that museums need to uh, focus on because we collect things and we store things and there's these six million photographs in, in, um, in Iceland show. I mean, and, and I think you can probably uh, expect the same sort of collections all over the world. I mean, I know that certainly there was, in this little museum I lived, uh, worked in in, in, uh, in northern Norway, they had a collection taken by a local photographer that was like 140,000 images that were digitalized and that was just like a museum with eight people working in it so so they are placing these growth questions in geological time and seeing that well maybe it isn't so important that we keep as you say every picture of every farmer with every horse outside this farm i think uh, these are really deep and uh, and uh, fascinating questions so again thank you for bringing that Yo creo que estamos llegando a un punto del debate muy interesante porque se está planteando because people are talking about uh, a possible limited growth of collections kept in museums. In Spain, we have a very abundant cultural wealth, and we have regulations which explain how to conserve that cultural heritage, but sometimes it's a problem uh, because, for instance, in Spain, uh, powers are devolved to the regions, to the autonomous communities. The four provincial museums with archaeology are completely saturated by the archaeological uh, collections. You were talking about photography, but you cannot imagine the number of crates of chunks of pottery that we keep in our mu provincial museums in Spain. Uh, we keep them in storage and they're just like small portions of, of pottery which are totally amorphous. And so is it worth keeping all those? And what does it take to do that? So once a cultural property enters the museum, it is automatically protected by the law, at least in Andalusia. So uh, immediately, a piece of uh, of a of a vase uh, automatically has the same level of protection than a painting by Zurbarán. So that gives us some thought for for the future. In Guggenheim, for instance, this is a modern or contemporary art museum, so they have their own acquisition policy. But. In the case of provincial museums, uh, such as this one, which actually receive all of the archaeological remains from from the from the digs and from the underground, etc., we do not have the choice. We must keep them. So this is also a reflection that we have to to make with regard to the sustainability of our museums, because the higher the amount of materials, the more storage space we need the more crates we need and people are using plastics because they they give you more durability we have used wooden crates but we know that they deteriorate cardboard is also often spoiled etc so we are not sustainable because we are increasing so fast but this is such a huge ethical question that people don't know what to do about it but since you are talking about that. Um, I'm just, you know, cracking it open, but it's difficult to give an answer. Well, now we have to wrap up the panel, but in the afternoon, we are going to talk about the calculation of the footprint, the impact of lighting in museums and transport. So in the, in the afternoon, we will keep on thinking about all that. We'll meet again here at four. So enjoy your lunch. <laughs>